Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, once again. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, cooler. I'm a final runner. Uh, good evening, folks. We want to welcome each and every one of you back to the Liberian Diaspora Forum uh, weekly talk show. Uh, our last two guests, Honorable Kabina Jana, Associate Justice of Supreme Court, and the Minister of Gender, Honorable Kessel, have both asked me to thank you, the audience, for giving them the questions that were not so tough, but they were challenging enough to keep them on their toes. Tonight, we have uh, Ms. Kula V. Fofana. Uh, Ms. Kula Fofana is an advocate and activist on young people's issues with emphasis on young women and girls. Uh, she's the executive director of Paramount Young Women Initiative, an organization which seeks to advocate, educate, and empower young women and girls. She holds a bachelor, of, bachelor, bachelor degree of art uh, from the university in mass communication. Yeah, excuse me, let me say that. She holds a Bachelor of Art degree in Mass Communication and Sociology from the African Methodist Episcopal University in Liberia, SAME University. She also graduated as a valedictorian of the Assembly of God Mission High School on Carway Road and was the first female president of the Student Council of Government. That's impressive. Uh, she has several... She has several trainings in different disciplines, including leadership, gender, peace, and conflict mitigation and resolution, uh, monitoring and evaluation, advocacy, sexual reproductive health and rights, gender-based violence and volunteerism, governance and human security in Africa. She has delivered several papers and spoken to different, spoken at many different forums. Uh, she was appointed by Her Excellency uh, President Ellen Johnson Salif as the co-chairperson on the national vision, uh, the one that's known as Vision 2030, uh, the very reason for which we have invited her here tonight. Uh, she has wealth of experience in young people's issue and has worked with several youth and student organizations and has volunteered with national institutions and served in different leadership Position. She shares her passion with broadcasting. Of course, I agree with that. That's why she's on the show. Ms. Fofana appreciates unity and diversity, and she's involved actively in the women's movement, but with quest for young women's involvement. Additionally, she loves traveling and writing opinion pieces. She has visited countries in three of the five continents on inter international engagement. Well, keep it at that, folks. That's who our guest is tonight, Ms. Kula V. Fofana, the co-chair for uh, the National Vision 2030, as many of you may know, a vision that was launched uh, sometime last year by the current regime, uh, Madam Ellen Johnson Salif's government. Uh, you probably noticed, uh, if you are listening well, uh, our guest has great passion for young people. Uh, and that's understandable. She's a very young person herself, probably the youngest guest we've ever hosted on this show. And so uh, with that said, I will turn the floor over to our guest. And uh, right after her brief remark, uh, I'll take a little quick turn here. I just got a test message that uh, one of our brothers in Liberia uh, was involved in a tragic accident, I believe today, yesterday in New York, this morning rather, and uh, somebody wanted to I'll say something briefly about that, in, you know, uh, on a recognition and sympathy to that situation, uh, which is a little bit unusual before we get the show kicked off. So, but for now, let me turn the floor over to our guest, Honorable Kula V. Fofana. The floor is yours, man. The man. Well, good evening. Well, um, first of all, are you hearing me? Is the audio okay? Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, I, yeah, we can hear you. You are very loud and clear. Okay. Thank you so much, and let me say a big thank you to all of the individuals who have helped to call me on to ensure that I participate this evening, and to those of you who have caught up some of your activities just to listen in and add your contribution to the development of our country, because this discussion here tonight will all um, gear towards understanding the developmental trend of our country. And I'm hoping that all of us can have um, a fruitful discussion and as we go along um, this evening. So again, thank you and thank you to the um, Liberian Diaspora Forum. I've been um, following some of your activities um, on the internet and you guys are doing a great job. 
Um, thank you so much. And thank you. Um, it is our hope that um, a lot of what you do will someday trickle down back home and to see how Liberians here who are doing great jobs can also go back to Liberia so that we all can help develop our country because that is the only way our country will be developed if all of us um, collectively join our hands to do that. But however, this evening, um, since we're going to be looking at the Vision 2030, um, looking at the challenges, the prospects, and where we are right now. Um, so why don't we do this? Because I'm one person who will really appreciate um, the interactive discussion where people can ask as many questions as possible so we can have um, a very fruitful discussion. But however, just to give a little um, discussion on what the vision practice is, because a lot of times um, people kind of confuse what the vision 2030 actually is to that of um, short-term um, other policy papers, because sometimes I've heard um, people confusing Vision 2030 to be like a project document, people confusing it to be like um, a strategy or policy or all that. But to just briefly say, because I know this evening um, after this long discussion, all of us will kind of, I mean, I will try my best um, as possible to kind of um, answer some of those questions that are awaiting me. <laughs> But however, Vision 2030 um, is a process. It's a research process that helps to understand Liberia's developmental trends as well as proffer a suggestion for moving forward. So the vision, um, and kind of people think that this is the government's vision, but this is not a government vision. Um, but it is a process where all Liberians got together to discuss and say this is where we want our country to go because um, a lot of times people ask the importance of vision. First of all, as an individual, I'm sure um, each of us have our own vision on uh, where we want to go as individuals, um, what we want to achieve because, you know, all of us have our own life then. So for a country like Liberia being one of the oldest on the continent, well, because a lot of times people argue it, whether we're actually independent or not, but, I mean, um, as our history says, we one of the um, first countries on the continent to get our independence. So we're over 100 years old. And looking at the, the country called um, our own, um, that is not a very clear understanding of um, that collectiveness on where we want to go as a people. So this process basically um, helps to understand where we have come from because there were, I mean, there were, some basic questions that were asked in terms of um, where we've come from. Because before you kind of develop a long-term strategy or a long-term agenda, you have to understand where you are coming from. Because um, looking at looking behind you, looking at the historicity, that is the challenges you've had. Um, because obviously, all of us know the issue of our wars that that uh, made a lot of people displaced and refugees and people went everywhere. Um, the issues of uh, the marginalization, you know, um, several issues underpin our um, challenges, especially where we are today. So we start to see what happened then. That is the retrospective analysis or the historicity, and then where we want to go. So since we have seen our past and reviewed it, and asking ourselves, okay, so now we're here, this is at this point, where are we now? And then where do we want to go? and how do we get there? So those were the basis of this entire process. Um, so throughout these different processes, when we did the baseline study, that is the retrospective analysis, so all the different challenges, the actors and factors that help shape and shape our country, um, looking at the, the international influences, um, the issue of our language, the issue of our identity, the issue of our religiosity, you know, all those different challenges, you know, try to understand um, why are we where we are. And then we also, um, so the retrospective analysis, the base study helped us to understand that concept. And then after the base study, there was what we call um, the um, consultation. So the consultations came in where Liberians themselves kind of understanding, like having all the consultations. So there was 156 consultations held um, across the country, and there were diaspora consultations held here in the U.S., and consultations was held in um, 
uh, in London for the Europe Liberian diaspora who are there, as well as for Africa, we had um, people from Ghana because as all of us know that there are a huge concentration of Liberians who are on the Zimbabwe um, refugee camp. So uh, some of them formed part of the consultation to represent the diaspora. And um, on, in, throughout Liberia, in all of the counties, there were consultations. So that was the second phase of the process. And then during that process also, there was um, what we call, um, after, the, after the retrospective analysis, the consultation, so there were regional consultations um, where the counties came together in a smaller fashion. Uh, so five regional consultations were held, and then um, 156 district consultations were also held. Um, and then um, the issues were derived, and there were what we call the national conference that was held in Banga, and then form up the whole entire process of coming up with the vision document. So this is like a, like a snapshot of the different practices that have been leading to having this whole process. But the vision didn't come alone. So there was this, um, I'm sure some of you have heard of the Roadmap for Reconciliation, so as a process um, to ensuring that the Liberian people can reconcile, so there was the whole um, process of um, the reconciliation roadmap. So basically those were the uh, two outcome documents of the Vision 2030. Um, but right now, some of you might be hearing about the agenda for transformation. So the agenda for transformation, um, in a term, is the economic development agenda, the short-term economic development agenda of this government to say, okay, this is, um, these are some of the key issues that Liberian mentioned during a visioning exercise process. So to make sure we help in um, reaching some of those key economic challenges, looking at the issue of food security, um, infrastructure, specifically road network and electricity. Uh, so the agenda for transformation in the short term kind of um, key on those um, areas. So probably these are some of the I main issues that led the whole process and how we went towards Zanga and then we came up with the vision statement. And the, the vision, there are lots of other things that came up, but the key vision statement is one people, one destiny, united for sustainable peace and development. So that is the vision. So all other things, looking at justice, looking at gender, policy, different issues, all to ensuring that we have this one people, one destiny, united for sustainable peace and development. So. That is it. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Kula. Wow. I now now I understand why you were made the co chair for that vision. <laughs> well, uh folks, if you just joining us, we want to welcome you to the Liberian Diaspora Forum Weekly Talk Show. Uh tonight we have the privilege of hosting Honorable Kula V Fofana, the co chairperson of uh, a national vision twenty thirty, and she just made a brief uh, introduction of what the vision is all about. Uh, in other words, it's not the government's vision, it's the people's vision. Now, as I told you earlier, I'm going to do something a little bit unusual. Uh, we're taking more like a little distraction uh, for the death of a Liberian this morning. There's a friend here, a friend, family, regular listener, uh, who like to uh, brief, uh, briefly, you know, uh, make that known to our listening audience, and uh, we will let him do so, and then shortly We'll start entertaining your question. In the meantime, I've opened up your question lines. Uh, you may begin dialing star 61 on your phone if you have questions. I see some of you here already, but to the rest of you, in case you haven't noticed, I've opened up the question line. So please dial star 61, and uh, we will get your questions over to the Honorable. Uh, let me take this. Mr. Kone? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you, Mr. Kuman, for giving me the opportunity. And um, welcome, Madam Fofana, our Honorable Fofana. Um, I just want to announce to the brother the death of our, one of our brother, beloved brother, Abdullah Duple. He died from AM Zion in Morovia. He had a tragic, tragic motor accident this morning, and he lost his life. So I just want us to take one minute of silence to pray for the brother and his family. All right. Thank you, Mr. Kruma, and thank, thank you to everyone. You. Thank you, and thanks uh, thanks to the audience for going through that, uh, for staying with us. Uh, we hope and pray that 
and Almighty God forgives the same. So, folks, with that said, uh, uh, once again, be, be reminded we have the Honorable Co-Chairperson of the Vision 2030 in Liberia. Now, I got some questions lined on here. Uh, keep them coming. Star 6-1 is what you need. Uh, if for any reason you can't dial star 6-1 as usual, uh, you may test your questions to 612-203-3820. Uh, once again, 612-203-3820. You can test your questions to that, or you can email them to Liberian Diaspora Forum at live.com. Of course, I forgot to mention my name is Kafuma Kruma. I'm hosting the show tonight, as always. So I'll take the first. Uh, well, let me start, my, uh, Madam, uh, Madam Fafana. Let me start by asking you, how is Vision 2030 any different from uh, the former President Charles Taylor's Vision 2024? If I'm, I think it was 2024. If I'm okay. correct. So how is this vision any different from that? Okay. All right. Um, thank you for that, and I expect that, obviously. Um, but let me add my voice to the previous um, caller that talked about the brother who passed away. Let me um, add my voice to say um, to sympathize with the family and ask the Almighty God to forgive the sins and give him a genesis. Um, however, the difference, between um, Vision 2024 and Vision 2030, or even beyond Vision 2024, because, um, you know, there were lots of different practices, like you had um, the Green Revolution, you had um, the, the uh, Mato Mattress, and then you had, uh, you know, those different, different, and then Vision 2024. Basically, the difference between all of those different practices in Vision 2030 was that those divisions where the leader's vision, that is, a, a president who comes in and says, um, okay, this is my vision for the country. I want by this time um, people should go back to the soil and make farm. By this time we want X, Y, Z to happen, you know, with all of those different um, processes. But the difference between this one and that one, this is a long-term vision process. And uh, specifically, let me talk about, let's, let's leave 2024 for a bit and then talk about those other ones, the Samuel Doe, um, the the Tobo, the Cotman, and you know the difference between those um, visions and Vision 2030 was basically those ones were leadership driven, where the president says, "This is my vision for the country. This is where I want to go. This is what we want. We should do. These are policies we should enact to ensure that this is achieved." But for Vision 2030, this was um, a huge consultative process because even for those other ones, the Matthew Mattress, the Green Revolution, and all that. Um, they were not consultative where you had people involved, the Liberian people having consultation across the country, including the diaspora, to, to find out, to, to all consult and say, let us all go collectively, and this is our vision for the country. But instead, it was the leader vision. So with that, when you have the leaders that are no longer around, then you have these challenges. But for Vision 2030, it's where the people themselves, and it's, multi, it's, it's, it's multi-sectoral, it's multi-stakeholder where you have the civil society involved, you have the young people involved, you have the media, because specifically at the Banga conference, at the end of the conference, civil society, the, the whole vision and process was turned over to civil society and say, hey, civil society, hey, young people, this is where we all have long been waiting for, you know. So how do we all take this process and run with it and say, you, you civil society, you, you, you young people, hold government accountable and other stakeholders hold government accountable and other, other, other parties because the implementation of Vision 2030 does not lie only with the government. You know, we'll talk about that more in terms of implementation. Um, but in terms of 2024, it was also a leader's aspiration where, um, I mean, I, because even during this process, we sought to look for all of those different papers, whether there were policies or any, any documentation or concept notes, but we couldn't find none. Um, like the Vision 2024, there was, there was a conference that we heard, um, and there was not a, an outcome. So the conference ended one way because what the people wanted didn't, didn't, didn't come forth. It, it, went, it should have, I mean, the leaders the leadership wanted it to be their way. So it was this other one, it's the other way around. This type, this time, it's the bottom top approach other than the top bottom approach. So uh, it was very consultative. I mean, day 2030, um, it included uh, multi-stakeholders, whether they drove the process. Because as you can see, I am I am not like a government, government person. So I'm from civil society. I'm from uh, a civil society background. 
where I'm, I'm involved largely in community organizing, um, as well as other people who are uh, from other political parties, especially on the steering committee. Members of the core team were all um, academicians who, who um, studied in different areas. You had educators, you had um, people who did uh, their, their, their backgrounds are in land, people who studied economy, people who studied um, the polit political um, landscape of our country. So if you, if you have all the conglomeration of these kinds of people, plus the people themselves, because our role was basically to drive the process of having a national vision document, right? So at the, at the bottom line is basically those other processes then include this multi-stakeholder process, having a consultative process inclusive of diaspora, and having the baseline study of the discussion. So that's what sets um, Vision 2030 apart from the Vision 2024 and the other visions. Um, okay. Thank you. Well, I will take my first caller. Uh, uh, as you know, some of, some of the numbers on my screen do not come with names, and so I'll be calling the last four digits of the number. Uh, I'll begin by calling 7867, 7867, last four digit. Uh, would you please tell us your name, where you're calling from, and your question for Honorable Fofana? 7867. Okay, uh, good evening, Honorable Fofana. Good evening, Mr. Kroma. Good evening, good evening, sir. Okay, uh, my name is Musa I have a fear a bit. Uh, there are a lot of presidents that have passed in our country, and they all come and a lot of visions. All right, the latest of the vision is the one that we just coined during Madame Celis administration. And during the, launch, the official launch of the vision in Bon County, the legislature did not attend the program. My fear is, is there any way that we can legislate the vision so we can all force ahead? If Madame Celis is not in power, the next president can follow the same vision, or is it going to be so open like it has been in the past? Any president who comes in power on his or own vision. That's my question this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keita. So, uh, Arma Fofana? Yeah. Is that a question? Yeah, I got it. Um, I want to thank him. Thank you for his question. Um, well, the issue of the legislatures um, participating during the regional consultations in all of the districts, um, um, they, they were, the legislature participated on a larger note, um, but because, you know, during the, the, the national conference, um, there were some challenges because at the time they were on agricultural break, um, so some of them were unable to be reached. Um, uh, the leadership of the legislature was in communication with us, and if we had the, um, um, the um, head of the Senate, Honorable Blessing Finley, who came um, at, the, at the meeting in, in Banga. But how be it, there has been a lot of discussion with the legislature. But on the issue of passing it into law, um, it, is, it is still a discussion because in most of the consultations we had, the people were saying that, hey, these are the challenges. You know, the past government came because it wasn't the law. So um, can we find a means how we pass this into law? So this has also been taken into consideration, whether we can pass, but other schools talk, as other people have argued that, well, a vision, you cannot pass a vision as a law. And what you can do as a law is to ensure that these people, um, the Liberian people, since they accepted that this is their vision, all the Liberian people said that this is our vision. So with the involvement of the Liberian people, during, I mean, when this government time elapsed, the next government or whoever is going through elections, what the Liberian people can ask them to, to do is any government or any proposed candidate who wants to come and contest in our district, in our constituency, in our communities, or for our country, you should have your platform laid as process of Vision 2030. So if your platform doesn't include Vision 2030, you should be, you should be asked to answer some questions, you know. But however, this is, this, on this issue of passage as a law, it's been ongoing, the discussion is on, so um, until we reach um, a consensus, but it is not yet final, but there are discussions also on how the Liberian people can hold their lawmakers, there will be lawmakers into, into contempt, I mean, into some issues if um, they refuse to go by what the Liberian people want as their vision. Thank you. 
I think the second caller, uh, the last four digits, 6105, 6105. Folks, if you just joining us, welcome to the Liberian Diaspora Forum. Uh, we have the Honorable Co-Chair President of uh, Vision 2030 in Liberia. Uh, she's very eloquent, uh, no question about that. So I actually uh, encourage you to dial star 61 so that you may have a say in this all-important discussion. 6105, please tell us your name, where you call it from, and your question for Honorable Fofana. 6105. Oh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Fofana, for taking my call. Mr. Fofana, I also, um, Mr. F also Mr. want to write some uh, remarks. I also want to write yeah. some uh, Madame Fofana and the United States, and also thank you for your position to carry on Vision 2030. Uh, you know, the last guy that asked a question, uh, I think, uh, I don't know what you were thinking about, but I just want to add a little bit and go back to your answer. And I, if I got your answer correct, you said that um, um, if this, leader, this present government is gone, and that uh, need people, those that will be coming in, those that will fail to follow this, then their constituents should now vote for them. Uh, uh, I want, I'm trying to paraphrase if I read that you play. In other words, it's more political that this vision should be accomplished. But one thing I know, a leader has to set a vision followed by a mission. And if a leader of today set a vision, and the next leader tell me, and look at that vision that is not workable, and we try to set his or her own vision, that should not play politically into any election. So I just wanted to touch a little bit on that. Uh, the question to the madam is, why vision 2030? Why can't be vision 2013? Why? That's number one question. Uh, secondly, what are you really hoping to accomplish? Uh, because I'm a, I'm a conservative Liberian. Whenever I hear vision, 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 we have heard a lot and a lot of vision. I think the moderator even asked the first question about vision 2024. If vision without a mission, uh, it becomes a problem for me. So if you set up your vision, and I see that in one year's time, nothing has been accomplished, you want to wait till 2030 before we can see your vision, realizing that i got a problem. Okay. So the so, question is, why not vision 2013? Is that correct? Why not vision 2013? And maybe followed by the mission. In 2013, wow. this is what we want to accomplish. Why vision 2030? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for helping me understand the entire question because at first I didn't quite get what you were trying to say. But however, um, um, in terms of understanding why Vision 2030 and not Vision 2013, um, you know, in, in a broader development um, processes, especially looking at it from an um, international development perspective, you will obviously um, start to understand in terms of Vision 2030 or in terms of aspirational or long-term studies, these are processes that are very important. So at the end of the day, as a people, you can say we set ourselves up to this time from now to 2030. So by 2030, we want to see ourselves at this place. So whatever you do in 2013, whatever you do in 2014, must lead you up to achieving 2030. So the process of um, why Vision 2030 is making sure we have a long-term development plan, we have a long-term vision to say our vision as a people is to make sure that Liberia is united because in our vision statement that says one people, one nation united for sustainable peace and development, you know, because if you just say Vision 2013, you know, it's very impossible because there are competing demands. There are demands on the soft issues. There are demands on the um, social services. There are demands on roads and infrastructure. 
So in the short term, what you can do in the short term, especially if you're looking at um, implementation of different policies, that's why um, they have different policies, that's why they have the National Health Policy, they have the New Education Reform Act, they have all these um, laws and policies, reform practices that are ongoing to ensure that by 2030, even though this government will not be in power or in place, but whoever government comes, that will help us leading to 2030. So, I mean, what I, what I can tell my brother is, um, in terms of a long-term um, um, future studies, it's basically us understanding how do we measure ourselves up to 2030. So in 2015, maybe we do a media review we do or, or we do a process review and say, okay, this is the, now in 2015, where are we? Like, I mean, I don't know, I mean, if some of you understand the MDGs, the, the post-2015 development agenda, everybody knows that, I mean, there were benchmarks, there were targets to reach like 2015 to reach certain targets. So the minimum development goals, now that the review processes are ongoing, then the, the, the different international partners and whoever that are stakeholders in those processes can say, okay, we didn't achieve this because of this. We didn't achieve this because of this, but these are the challenges. So what do we do in the short term to make sure that we achieve these? So in terms of development, that's how the trend is when you're looking at the long-term development studies. So you don't, I mean, the short term, you can look at all those emerging different challenges that are happening. Thank you. you get me? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, we are hearing you loud and clear. Thank okay. you. Uh, folks, please dial star six and one. Uh, if you have questions, comment, or concern. With that, I'll take the next caller. Uh, uh, there's a name with this number, Musa Kamara. Mr. Musa Kamara, please tell us where you're calling from and your question for Honorable Fofana. Thank you, Honorable Kamara. Hi, Mrs. Mrs. Fofana. Uh, I'm calling. My name is Musa Kamara. I'm calling from New York City. Welcome to the program. Uh, and uh, uh, let me first assure you that I have heard about uh, this mission for Liberia for the longest. What I wanted to know is this mission, is this. Musa, 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 Kamara, Musa Kamara, Musa Kamara. You're not too clear, Musa Kamara. You might want to adjust your phone or change your position. Yeah. You know, we we are better, you can better hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, much better. Yep. Yeah. Okay, my portion is in two parts. I want to know who is spon is this governmental or sponsor program? Is this NGO sponsor program? Uh, and if so, uh, is this uh, is this going to address uh, a problem that is facing Liberia right now as we speak, or is this only going to address the vision of of 2020? Because I'm speaking about we have. We have a lot of liberals right now are not working. You know, uh, uh, what is the mission is, or uh, what are some of the things that uh, the mission is going to address on those issues? And and if, I may ask, what do you really need from us, especially people who are in the diaspora? Thank you. So, uh, uh Havana? Yep. Yeah, your question. Uh, if I understood him right, uh, what impact will Vision 2030 have on the, on the life of Liberians, given the number of uh, uh, the level of unemployment, and uh, how can the diaspora Liberians be of any assistance to the vision? Mm -hmm. uh, most of is the vision of government. I know you addressed that part earlier, but mm -hmm. is the government is the mission government sponsor or NGO? Okay. Yeah, I, I I did understand his um, his question, and I kind of like the last question that asked specifically about what role Liberians in the diaspora can play. But before I come to that, let me talk about um, in terms of sponsorship um, that he asked whether this is the government or is sponsored by NGO. Um, first of all, this whole idea of the of the um, visioning process for Liberia didn't start today, it didn't start yesterday. It started years, years, years ago um, when um, um, Africa started having discussions on long term because one of the challenges of um, different problem in, in Africa is that uh, the leaders come with their own ideas and their own thing and they just run with it and whatever happens just happens. Um, so Liberia thought to kind of change from that uh, normal happening to say, okay, let us collectively have a vision for Liberia. So based on that, because obviously the sitting government will, will I mean, will, cannot 
recuse herself from the process. So that's why, because the sitting government is, is in power, so whoever government uh, was going to be in place and this discussion comes about, they might, I don't know, depending on um, what will be their background, but they might want to venture in working for a long-term process for a country like ours with all of these challenges that we've had. So um, so it is government are co-sponsors. That is, the way the structure is, there is the national core team, as I mentioned earlier. So the national core team are these professional researchers who are non-government actors, um, who are private citizens, who are doing their private businesses, who are, who are formal ministers. And so, uh, so they work in the, the core team aspect, and then you have the um, people who are working on the secretariat. Um, initially, we were um, 15 secretariat members, but until we lost one of the members, Honorable Jala um, KKK Kamara, who lost his life uh, when we were in the same process, and so we remained 14 until during the conference, where we had the conference committee um, that carried us on to additional 15 with Dr. Elwood John as uh, one of the coaches. So, I mean, so that's how the whole process is. And then the government entity that are co sponsors, that is the government commission, that has her mandate to look at long term visioning and looking at the governance issues of the country and also the um, Ministry of Planning, then, because Obviously, in terms of planning um, and, and long-term studies, looking at economic policies and all that. So they were the co-sponsors on behalf of government, representing government at that structure. So structurally, that's how the, the, the vision process is structured. In terms of specifically what um, we need from the diaspora or uh, how the diaspora can get involved, I think it's, it's one of the best and key questions I've heard this evening. Because one thing um, for us in Liberia is to see how, because we know we have huge population of Liberians living in the U.S., in Europe, in other parts of the world. So what the diaspora community can ask, well, because I'm one person who believes and thinks that the diaspora can be a great help to Liberia with all of the resources that is educationally especially those Liberians who are here doing good job there. Liberians who are here, they're not doing so much good job, but however, Liberians are Liberians. So we require everyone to contribute. So your contribution can be um, coming back home and, and, and contributing in the educational sector. So for Liberia to achieve the vision by 2030, we need to ensure that the educational system is structured well, you know, because our, our edu- I can you know like our educational system right now is not one of the best in Africa. It, it probably it might be among the least, so we need um, Liberians who are in, in every sector. I mean, technical education, um, medical education, just, uh, I mean, all sectors, because right now, world Liberian, Liberian, all of the technicians, whether it's um, technicians um, in uh, infrastructure, because right now, with all of the need for development, Liberia will need the know-how. So where will we get those know-how from? We, we should depend on the data, but if Liberians and that are not going back home to provide those services or to get involved into the development area, and not just one government job or just not just one to be ministers or so, but to get involved into the mainstream development process, that is um, medical, technical, educational, social, just however you can contribute. So that is the key thing we will need Liberians to jump in and to ensuring that this vision is achieved. Thank you. Folks, yeah. if you have a, if you have a say, comment, concern, or question, uh, now is the time to dial star 61. And look on your phone, dial star 61. We will, we will open up your line so, you can, so that you can ask your question, make your comment, raise your concern. Uh, uh, we'll go to Mr. Jara. Apparently, he has a follow-up question, uh, or maybe he's not too happy with his answer. Uh, Mr. Jara, welcome back to the Brand Diaspora Forum. Please, uh, uh, a brief follow-up question, sir. Oh, hello, six one zero five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, I'm not Mr. Jala. I'm actually Daisy. But anyway, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Kumar. Uh, it's a follow-up question. Um, you know, I intentionally asked that question, why not vision uh, 2018? I intentionally asked the question. 
the reason simple. So every time we spend money on these programs, vision, 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 it's not for nothing. Okay? It's not for nothing. At the end of the day, the vision is not accomplished. Why can't we shorten it? Why can't we just, okay, instead of setting vision, let's have the mission from, let's say from uh, January 20th, let's say January 1st of 2013 to December 31st, 2013. This is what we want to achieve, okay? Instead of setting out a new vision, because people are just kind of impatient uh, to hear about vision 20. Uh, that is Vision 2024. You know, I don't mean that uh, we're not work, and they have not worked for us. So why can't we? Why can't we just talk something different instead of spending money uh, on this uh, program? Because it's not for nothing. All those transportation people, you, you guys flying from uh, 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 Liberia to Ghana, all that money. And at the end, if we don't accomplish anything, it turned out to be a debt. I follow $29.4 million for agriculture uh, purposes to be given to local county and other counties for, for rehabilitation. And this is what we, we talk about vision. With the farmers, if they are not doing well, it becomes a problem. $29.4 million is not a small amount for okay. farmers. This is like coffee. Yeah, I come here. I come here, Honorable. And by the time I check on that, they said the government is broke. And that loan was taken, uh, uh, it was a loan. It's not free. It's a debt to the government. Okay? Then how will you expect some of these people to, to make it before the, the 2030? Okay? I'm, I'm just trying to make this comment, you know, because I'm kind of a little bit skeptical when people talk about Vision 2030, Vision 2024, that have never and ever worked for us. So I'm just concerned about what can we call it short, 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 so that at the end of the day, at least we see something. Because... Okay. Yeah, uh, the, the, yeah, our guests have not come out to really point out what okay. has been accomplished since the vision was set up. Since, let okay. me just put it this way. Let's, let's give her another what, chance. Okay, yeah, so, okay yeah. what, 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 what have you accomplished since, okay. uh, the establishment since, of since the, 2012 the vision was launched, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. thank you, Mr. Zizi. Hello, Fafana? Yep. Um, well, I do on this. Yeah, I do understand um, what my brother is talking about. But, again, if you do not come from a development background, then you will start asking um, some of the same questions that he's saying with all of the frustration in his voice. But, however, I do sincerely understand what he's trying to say. But um, in terms of what we've been able to do, because, as you just said, um, the Vision 2030 conference, to come up with the final vision document was held in December of 2012, you know, and this is uh, March of um, 2013, just three months later. But however, what has happened is um, talking of alignment and realignment, because if you do all these um, long-term development studies, you will have to kind of see how to realign all of your different policies that are ongoing right now because obviously government can start to say, I want to stop and wait for what's going on. So most of what he's talked about is already ongoing, but I just want to mention that he, he, he mentioned some $29 million. I mean, to be frank with you, I don't know what, where that number is coming from. And if he here, I can give him my email address and be able to give him more information. I would be so glad to have um, information on where he's talking about this 29 million. But however the case is, I think what needs to happen now is to see how um, we all bench our our thinking that this hasn't worked. You know, it's good to be, I mean, sometimes people can be um, pessimistic about things, but it's also good to also look at the the bright side of it to see what can we do differently this time around. I just explained why, how this vision 2030 is different from the other visions. So that should be a better idea to say, okay, maybe this will work or let's trust this time around or let's suggest this is how we want it to work and let us not say, oh, it will not work. Let us do this because the matter of fact is we've already gone, that there's already a vision that Liberian people got together and said, okay, this is what we want to achieve. But how be it? Um, I think what what um, what he's basically um, thinking of is the immediate economic transformation and the structuring plan. And again, there's an, an agenda for transformation, 
So he's asking what we've been able to do. So the government also, as part of this crisis, had the agenda for transformation. That is the short-term development plan that I mentioned earlier that um, seeks to affect of the current development trends, the um, um, process of economic revitalization, looking at issues of the road reconstruction, because road, as all of us know, the issue of farm to market road, bringing products to things from Rovia and other places, um, looking uh, at how electricity is such a big deal because, I mean, electricity helps to boom the economy, trying to repair our different, I mean, infrastructure. So, I mean, those are things that are currently happening, and um, the issue of alignment, realignment that I mentioned earlier, is one of the one of the major challenges because this is where we are at right now, where we are having discussions on how do we ensure that all of our different policies in the health sector, in the transport sector, in the road um, reconstruction sector, in all of the different sectors, the education sector, how do they feed and speak specifically to the vision? And how do our international partners, that is the FBI, the USAID, and all those other international partners that have such huge interest in our country, how do they conform their own development agenda to our national development agenda, to Vision 2030? So how do we ensure that all of these different partners and bilaterals and, and multilateral uh, companies, the people who are building all these huge hotels, and see, how do we say, okay, our unemployment rate right now is this amount. So by this time, if you build this hotel here, we want to ensure, we want you to make sure that you have X amount of Liberians employed in this place. So at the end of the day, we can alleviate poverty, ensuring that we, you employ people that will ask our numbers of high rate of employment. How do we ensure that we transform um, from um, the, the, the extractive industrial processes where we export all of our raw materials? How do we do value addition? And the value addition comes in where we say, okay, we have all these rubbers, right? And now there are companies who are going to be producing palm oil and all these other things. How do we so that we have factories who will make sure that those raw materials will be transformed from um, a product, uh, um, an attractive process to exporting our timbers and everything to, to making sure that they are factories to produce those into finished products at the end of the day, those companies will now go out and go manufacture these things and bring it back to us and sell it at high rate and we pay more money for it. So those are the discussions that are ongoing right now and talking about alignment and realignment because if we're talking about long-term development plans to get us to where we want to go, these are decisions that have to be made both with the international partners, the government and legislatures and governments to come, even all those concessions, how do they ensure that they're going to help us achieve our Vision 2030? Thank you. Uh, next caller, Precious Davis. Precious Davis, uh, please tell us where you're calling from and your question for Honorable Fofana. Precious Davis. Hello? Well, this is not Precious Davis. Uh, this is Ali Sila. Oh, that's the uh, name on the phone, Honorable Sila. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, anyway. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the program, uh, Kafuma Kroma, and I think I will, I will discuss it. Uh, uh, Honorable Ms. Kula Fofana, um, you know, I just wanted to make a point. Uh, you know, the complexities of our country, uh, whether it's basic social services, whether it's infrastructural, economic revitalization, justice and rule of law, uh, the issue of the uh, the visioning process uh, addresses all of the issues in terms of those complexities. Uh, I think when the uh, I was listening um, when the other caller talked about vision 2013, I think the visioning is about long-term project, uh, the aspiration of the Liberian people. I think that is the process in which. Uh, this vision will be taken Liberia into. So the, the, the complexity is there now. How do the government of Liberia implement this? I think the, the government has started to put in the mechanism in which uh, to address some of these issues, like the agenda for transformation. Uh, these are policies that the government will be developing. 
have been monitored by the LDR, uh, the Liberal Development Alliance, uh, that will be tracking all of these indicators from the different ministries and agencies. Uh, so at least uh, by 2015, 2020, uh, there will be evaluation. Um, but I, you know, I just wanted to make that point that uh, sometimes in terms of the government uh, deliverables, uh, we need to be thinking about how the government can implement that and then what kind of mechanism the government has put in place. Uh, but I think this government has started to put most of those mechanisms in place, especially uh, with the agenda for transformation. Um, so I just wanted to make that input. But I think that, uh, Kafuma, I think you're doing a wonderful job of uh, engaging stakeholders in Liberia, uh, where our brothers and sisters in, in the U.S. here can have first-hand uh, information from them. Uh, so Thank I think you. that's a very that's a very very good thing for our country, but I think Thank the you. vision the the vision of our brothers and sisters in the diaspora should be the vision of going back to Liberia and contribute. Uh, we have we have capacity problem in our country. We have Liberians in the diaspora with all of the necessary capacity to develop our country. I think we need to make some sacrifices in terms of our country, in terms of making impact to our children. Uh, the Liberian children, the youth of Liberia, can benefit tremendously from this capacity that you guys have developed in the diaspora here. So I think that should be the vision of all of us who are in the diaspora uh, to go back home. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you. And, I, and I'm enjoying thank it. You. So thank you. Uh, Madam Kula, you're doing a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Sila. Uh, thank you for your hospitality when I visited Liberia a few months ago, two months ago. Uh, Honorable Kula, unless you have something to add to that comment, I don't think that was a question. Uh, do you care to add to that or just go ahead with the next caller? Yeah, I think you should go. I think it was just a comment, and I think, um, like all of what I've said, he just like, re emphasized some of the points uh, on. Okay. Um, yeah, so you can go ahead with the next caller. Thank you. Our next caller, no name, 9084, 9084. Would you kindly tell us your name, where you got it from, and your question for Honorable Fofana, 9084. Yeah, uh, good evening. My name is uh, Bob Le Cherie. And uh, are you getting me? Yeah, yeah I'm getting you. Welcome, yeah, welcome okay. Mr. Cherie. Uh, yeah. I'm calling from New Jersey. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you for, for uh, establishing such a forum that will award the opportunity to express some of our grievances. And I want to also thank uh, Madam Fofana for coming on air at least to elaborate on some of the visions she had. But uh, 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 looking at the situation that we're right now, I know that uh, uh, the problem with the visions, I know the a vision is always good for anybody. Uh, almost all political uh, leadership over there in office, they all, everybody advocated for, uh, they come out and present uh, things that they have for the Liberian people and what they're going to do when they get in public office. These are some of the visions they put forward before they can be elected into office. And I also understand from her, if my memory can set me right, that she... Uh, it is the citizenry that really put up this vision, uh, which is extremely good. But I know Vision 2024 was almost of the same uh, thing. Uh, it's all about bringing development to the nation. But uh, before a vision can be implemented in the midst of uh, kind of corruption that is currently going in the nation, it will be very, very difficult for us. We can have all the best vision like they have now. It's going to be the same thing we're going to be advocating all the time. But as one caller said that, you know, it should be vision 2013 instead of 2030. Well, that is too close. If you, if you look at it, vision is not just something that will be implemented uh, immediately, uh, a couple of months or something. A vision is a long-term concept. But... Uh, the problem that I have is that is there any way that the vision can be uh, 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 can really be divided 
uh, uh, subdivided to the various government, like the LA government, have a portion of it that they can implement, you know, before her turn can be over, to be followed by uh, to be followed by other administration in succession. And uh, okay. yeah, and so far that's 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 the most important. Can is it possible that they can do that? So. Uh, and also try to eradicate some of the corruption that is going on because it's too rampant, you know. So uh, I know it's going to hinder any development or infrastructure development, whatever capacity they have over there, is it really going to have impact on it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah. We are listening. Yeah, um, I listened to the caller. Uh, one, one, one thing I'm hoping on is, I'm hoping that the callers are actually listening to the conversation that is ongoing and right. not just coming yeah, not just coming and asking questions that they already have. But like what we said, this government has had the agenda for transformation and there are processes of alignment and realignment to ensure that it addressed the current emerging issues in the country. And he just have a right in terms of corruption. If all of us decide to contribute, whether you're the president, whether you're a lawmaker, whether you're an individual in the justice sector, whether you're just an ordinary librarian, whether you're a teacher, and you decide to do your piece of the job clearly without being corrupt, of course we're going to achieve vision to this area. But if, if there's this huge issue of corruption, when, when, when the issue of integrity comes, um, leaders don't want to resign. They don't want to come and account for what they've been able to, what they've stolen from the like people. And so these are challenges. I mean, the government can try to address it, but it also comes back to us as Liberians. How do we hold our leaders accountable? How do we hold ourselves accountable? So it's basically in terms of short term, the government has, is, I mean, we're still doing a process of alignment. And then again, the agenda for transformation is that um, short term development agenda for the government. And like um, Ali mentioned, there is also the um, like the, the LDA that, that says the Liberian Development Alliance that is comprising of civil society actors, the media, and other other people to track the, 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 the current uh, achievement of Vision 2030 and the agenda for transformation in the short term. So um, again, I mean, it's just that people should kind of listen to the conversation. If I mean, I mean, somebody always like said. If you're the last to come to church, don't raise a song. Maybe the song you raised, somebody already sang that song. <laughs> so I'm, just, I'm just hoping that people will listen. Yeah, people will listen um, before, I mean, before they ask some of the questions, however. But I think the conversation is um, ongoing very well. Yeah, okay. Well, that's a good point. But uh, let, me, uh, let me suggest that if you find questions being repeated, um, Sometimes it could be that the person has just called in, or I don't know, but it could be number any number of reasons. Uh, but yeah. I do understand you can't keep repeating one thing over and over. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. We will take the we'll take the next caller, uh, folks. If you just joining us, we want to welcome you uh, profoundly to the Liberian Diaspora Forum weekly talk show. Uh, we have Honorable Kula V Fofana, the co-chairperson for Vision 2030. Uh, we ask that you dial star six one, particularly the women. I see a lot of you on here. Trust me, I don't want to pick on you, but uh, Kula Fofana is a woman, a women advocate, so you will do her justice if you speak out. Please dial star star six one on your phone and have your say. We'll take the next caller. Uh, that happens to be Mr. Willie. Mr. Willie, would you please tell us where you're calling from and your question for number Fofana, Mr. Willie? Yeah, this is most already calling from Coastville, Pennsylvania. Uh, Kula, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to respond quickly in my one-minute question period to the last one of the callers who was against the idea of the vision 2030. I mean, from the inception of this government, there was something set up called the, the PRS, Poverty Reduction Strategy. And the idea behind the poverty reduction strategy was to design a framework that would foster agricultural growth, reconciliation, and rule of law. But we've noticed that that document is just a framework. It is not a bonding document on all Liberian that 
if you don't go by this document, you're going to go to jail. And we see the introduction of the Marina Development Goal in 2000. And everywhere in the world today, Marina Development Goal is being used as a yardstick to guide governance work. So the, 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 the Vision 2030 is also similar to the two framework that I just mentioned. What we need to do is to give a chance to breathe, to give a chance to nurture itself. And the nurturing process is what is going on right now, where you find members traveling to different states, different communities, trying to inform the people. It is difficult to consolidate, consolidate a, a, a processing like Bureau with all open enough for people to participate. This is why we went to war, because it was just like unilateral. But if we got a system where people want to be participatory this time around, let the county decide what they want for their county is be very good. So I just want everybody to be patient enough, like cool ourselves on the also of our introduction, that we just they just had a launch in December. And December to March, it's a lot of work. You're talking about a lot of paperwork has to be done. And after this, these paperwork are put together, you have to sell them to the public. So... The fact that we have the Millennium Development Goal that has been existing since 2000, and today we're still looking up to it for help, Vision 2030, I think, should be a document that we can also rely on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Fana, uh, uh, Mr. Wally. Rafafana, you want to add anything to that or just leave it as, uh, as, as that? Yeah, I think, I think he was right. I mean, like, this is what I'm hoping a lot of uh, librarians in the diaspora will basically like understand, seek to understand what is actually this whole process, what the vision is, and ask questions and follow the process through to ensuring that they we all understand this development training and how we can all support it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before I take the next call, I'd like to ask, so how does the government decide uh, which uh, which public initiative to support and which one not to. Uh, and let me be a little specific. How, for instance, the government of Liberia will be reluctant to implement the TRC report, but yet uh, uh, she's so quick to embrace some other initiative now known as Vision 2030. Uh, why, you know, why not support? And how was it? How how how, how are decisions made? In other words, or how who decides uh, which one to embrace and which one to not? Um, to be frank with you, I didn't quite get I think the basic point is um, how um, the TRC um, process, the really TRC report, tie into this whole um, Vision 2030, if I'm framing it that way, or how um, decisions on um, what is the vision, because our role as steering committee wasn't to decide um, this is what will go finally but the role of the Liberian people that throughout the consultation said, because there were emerging themes and said these are the issues. And to be frank with you, one of the key outcomes, like I mentioned earlier, is the issue of reconciliation. Liberians unanimously mentioned the importance of reconciliation because we cannot go a step further, especially looking at our history, where we came from, and the challenges there of if we do not reconcile. So based on that, I, I said the... Um, um, process concluded with two major documents. One was, I mean, three, in fact. One is the Vision 2030 um, paper. The second has to do with the, um, the agenda for transformation, and the third has to do with the roadmap for reconciliation. So the roadmap for reconciliation includes a lot of some of what the CRC report has mentioned. Um, and so in terms of um, those reconciliation process, I'm sure you, you guys in the diaspora are following, even the setting up of um, this peace ambassadorial uh, position on one of the um, huge, the key opposition political party, Ambassador George, we are with now the head of the reconciliation initiative. Um, and there has been other different um, involvement because we have the, the, um, the INCHR, that is the, uh, the Human Rights Commission, so there has been all these other processes performed by the roadmap of reconciliation that also specifically speaks to the issue of reconciliation out of the um, re uh, the TRC recommendations that that came out. So as we speak, there, there were there were lots of discussion around that, and, and in fact, the the roadmap of reconciliation came from um, now 
to 2018, like a, um, um, yeah, so from now to 2018, so like a five-year um, reconciliation uh, plan for, for the country. So, again, we all can hope that at the end of the day, Liberians will be able to reconcile our differences because we know the issues of recon- in reconciliation, of course, you know, doesn't come without justice. So um, the people, I mean, Liberians need justice, we need to reconcile. So with all of these different emerging practices, let us give um, the, the, the chance to the process, how they roll out and how they all um, feed into achieving the ultimate vision 2030. Thank you. Thank you, Rufafana. Uh, I'll go ahead and take my next caller. Uh, well, what is it called? Um, Mr. Zizi, I, I'm, I'm seeing your number. I know you want to make another follow-up, but uh, we have to allow first-time caller. I'll get to you shortly. I'll take the next caller. Uh, that happens to be, I believe, is Mr. George Toto. George Toto, would you please tell us where you're calling from uh, in your question for Rufafana, George Toto? Yeah, this is. Uh, I'm calling from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Welcome to the show. Oh, uh, thank you, and also thank to Madam Fofana, you know, for coming up to give us on almost any of the of the vision 2030. Uh, my concern is, uh, Madam Fofana, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, most of the time, some always visit there. Uh, or uh, Liberia a couple a uh, few years ago. Uh, I'm a, I'm a bit wrong, I seem to be correct uh, most of the time they refer to Liberian diaspora of the sixteen county of Liberia. Did I again? I didn't hear that part. I'm I'm he, saying that most, of, most the of the time they refer to yeah. Mm-hmm. Liberian diaspora of the sixteen county of Liberia. That they didn't uh, come from Liberia? Oh no, the Liberia in the diaspora have been referred to as the 16th county of Liberia. Oh, the 16th county. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> and that's a that's a that's a statement. Uh, that's a statement that normally made by the president of Liberia. And when they were launching the vision 2030 in Banga, I want to do that. Read some of the document. Maybe I'm gonna be an oversight. But in terms of reconciliation, I don't know if they are looking at only people in Liberia or they are looking at Liberian diaspora. I did not see any. I did not see any line in our document that reflect to Liberian diaspora how they can contribute to what the vision to tell the everything was just about Liberia, Liberia. But I did not see specific reference. I don't ever. I may be wrong, but I don't think you clear my dad on that because I went to the document. This is such a thing that are referring to us. Thank you. Okay. Um, if, like he said, people normally um, refer to Liberians in the diaspora as the 16th county. Well, uh, maybe people who do that, they're basically um, trying to see how um, people in, in the diaspora can see a part of Liberia because a lot of times Liberians that have come over here have totally um, disconnected themselves from Liberia. You know, but however... Um, I think the key point that he, he made uh, was the fact of um, whether what role Liberians in the diaspora can play. What happened at, at this national conference, there wasn't like a shared role and say, okay, Liberians uh, in the diaspora should do X, Y, Z. Um, Liberians at home should do X, Y, Z. Liberians this other place in the rural areas. So Liberia was referred to in general. So the role of civil society, because there are Liberians here in the diaspora who are involved in a lot of non-governmental and um, some charity organizations. So those Liberians, how can they contribute? Like I mentioned earlier, what can you do? All of what you've learned here, because Liberia right now needs all of the capacity needed. So in terms of achieving Vision 2030, you know, it's just difficult to say, okay, Liberians in the diaspora, you are responsible to build a role. First of all, Liberians in the diaspora, they're everywhere, Europe, uh, like even here in America, in Texas, in Minnesota, in all of the states in the U.S., um, in Ghana, in Africa, in all of the other places in China. So it was kind of in terms of trying to picture how how it look in terms of sharing responsibility, you would say. So how would you even put that together to say, like, girl, in the diaspora, this is what you're supposed to do. But however, what happened was every Liberian has a role to play. 
So you as a Liberian, as an individual Liberian, you choose your role. What role would you want to play to ensuring that Liberia reaches its ultimate goal, that is in 2030, right? So probably those little things that people um, kind of overlook are the things that will take us to 2030. For instance, let's say Liberians in the diaspora who are doing all these great jobs, Maybe a lot of time people take their break, vacation break or summer break or whatever break, go back home and say, maybe I'm going to volunteer my time to one government school. So say, I'm going to teach Tottenham High, I'm going to teach this where I'm going to teach all these other government schools free time and just contribute and learning all of the things and see, kind of see the learning environment. You know, when you come back, you say, okay, this is what this school needs. Let us do this. A lot of Liberians are doing charity work at home. So how do we, like, do that. I mean, go to the university and say, I have my background in XYZ. I need to contribute to see, let me go to the engineering department and teach, maybe volunteer my time or, or contribute now the Ministry of Public Works. Go to the Ministry of Public Works. I'm here just to volunteer and see. You know, there are several different ways that parents here can do it. So there wasn't like a specific role and responsibility for each and every Liberian. So there is responsibility for everyone, including civil society and the young people, the media, and everybody else. So let us all see how we can use our own time and talent to contribute to achieving Vision 2030. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I take my next call, I got my first test message question here, and uh, it's a very brief one, so that's why I'm... Uh, the question is, do you support dual citizenship in Liberia? If yes, why? If not, why? <laughs> from uh, from Victor. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I think what we need to do because I'm sure even even with the different consultations that happen in diaspora here in Africa, in in Europe, I mean this issue of dual citizenship was one of the key in Liberians here, um, who for one of some reasons that some of them were poor, some of them had to do it because of the prevailing circumstances and conditions. So, I mean, they were all um, they were all forced to do certain things. So, I mean, obviously, if our Liberian wants to go back home to contribute, of course, you're welcome. But, however, in terms of my own opinion on the, on, I mean, on the dual citizenship, I think for this evening we're looking at Vision 2030, and maybe we could leave this because I'm sure a lot of Liberians might call and be asking the same question of dual citizenship. But, however, if we can just focus on um, Vision 2030 discussion this evening and probably next time I'm here for a longer time or whenever, or we can still call back from Liberia and then have a full discussion on the pros and cons of our dual citizenship and how I think um, this whole issue can be approached. Wow. But I think uh, Liberians that... everywhere should be Say that again? Okay. Well, so that's interesting. Uh, uh, dual citizenship, we have to set up a particular show for that. Uh, that oh uh, so you don't this is not the ideal program today we we should focus it on uh, vision twenty thirty and not dual citizenship for now right no yeah because the thing is because I, I, for me I, what I what I do I don't just say okay I support um, dual citizenship or I don't support dual citizenship so when having these discussions it's important that I explain more to say why I think dual citizenship is important right now in Liberia. What can we do to ensure that this is okay? So if we start having all those conversations and start going in depth, we might kind of lose. I'm sure you're getting what I'm trying to say. We right. might kind of yeah. lose yeah. the essence of this evening conversation yeah. around Tonight, this. Tonight's conversation. But what, yeah, okay. but what could happen? What could also happen is probably if we can, how we can tie in this issue of dual citizens, Probably maybe one of the questions should be, what does the Vision 2030 statement says about dual citizenship? Then with that, I can say, so what, what, do I support Vision 20? I mean, do I support the dual citizenship? Then I will have to be, I have to be given, I will have to be given the chance to explain more on what I think, what should happen, okay. how we should approach this whole issue of dual citizenship. Okay, thank you. I'll take the next caller, no name, 6929-6929. Please tell us your name, where you call you from, and your question for Honorable Fofana. 6929, your uh -huh. name. Location uh, and question. Uh, my name is Clarence Gono. Uh, I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Welcome uh, to the show. <laughs> Mr. Father, thank you for coming on tonight. Uh, really, I want to move from uh, the general concept of achieving everything uh, good for the appearance to specific things that can be done in the uh, year and now. Now, my, my question is, is there any measurable 
specific educational plan that this Vision 2030 may have in the year and now that can be implemented while moving forward. Uh, you are kind of coming fluctuating where it was some point I will hear, some point will go low. But however, what I try to capture is basically asking about the educational plan, what does the Vision 2030 have for education? Is that correct? Yeah, I, want, I wanted to know if you have some sort of uh, measurable, specific educational plan, educational plan that, uh, that you have in the year and now uh, while moving forward so that that particular specific educational plan can be implemented right away while moving forward. Do you have that? Okay, I, I got your point. Um, thank you. What, thank you very much. Um, in terms of the educational plan, earlier on I talked about um, how we're doing the aspect of alignment and realignment. Prior to the vision, um, as all of us will be aware that this government, this is the second term of the government, though some ministers have been changed and swapped or some resigned or whatever the case is. But, however, the different sectors within the government develop um, their own strategies and plans and all that. So within the educational sector, um, there has been a, the, the education policy, but also there is the, the um, Education Act of 2011. And that Education Act speaks um, to the different sectors, that is the early child education, the early education it speaks to um, the um, tertiary education. You know, it, it, it speaks to all of the different educational education, all of the different segments of the educational um, sector. So there is the, 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 what, what is called the, the Education Act of 2011, and the Ministry of Education is implementing that, and there is also the new curriculum that's reviewed every year. So there are some um, progress made towards the educational sector. So with, for the vision, the vision is not sectorial. If I say sectorial, what I mean, it's not like, okay, the vision, because obviously if we, if we do the vision as sectorial, we say, okay, for education, you should do X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. So there will be a huge, you know, vision paper that nobody will be able to read. Obviously, a lot of people don't like reading it. If something is boring, um, but to be to be more specific, the the the, the, the prospect and the um, um, document and the the laws, like I mentioned, within the education sector, but within the vision, there are different there are different themes like the issue of rule of law, the issue of justice, the issue of um, empowerment, the issue of, um, I mean, employment, you know, economic revitalization, the issue of um, the social privileges and structures. So there are just different components within the entire vision, but there's not like a whole, full vision 2030 on education. No, so there's the general vision 2030, so all of those different arms in government. So like I said, we're doing alignment and realignment, how those different policies and plans and agendas that are within the different sectors will speak specifically to the Vision 2030 agenda. Okay, thank you. Uh, quickly, uh, there are so many people in the queue waiting. Uh, folks, be reminded that uh, we are uh, well over halfway through the show, so uh, if you got questions, now may be the time to dial star 61. Uh, but let me re take this test message question here quickly. It comes from Mobility in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, what does Vision 2030 say about dual citizenship then? Or is there anywhere in the Vision 2030 that focuses on dual citizenship? You know, I knew I, I you know, I expected that, however, but uh, thanks to my brother for asking that. Um, okay, so what Vision 2030 says about um, dual citizenship? Basically, what Vision 2030 focused on was, one, like I mentioned, all of the conversations that happen across um, Liberia and the diaspora and all that. So specifically on the um, dual citizen issue, there is not like a clear decision on what um, um, what what the vision says about um, dual citizenship. Whether okay now dual citizenship is, is is I mean is open and everything else. Even now now what is happening because the issue of dual citizenship, what the what specifically what the um, vision coordinator spoke about is the asset of law reform. So in the process of law reform, because the issue of dual citizenship has a lot to do with our law and our legal system, especially um, looking at it from a constitutional perspective. Right now what has happened is uh, there, has been, um, the, the, there has been a committee to review the Constitution. 
So the, review, the, 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 the Constitutional Review Committee has, has already been set up. So what Liberia, in the diaspora that's here, um, that, I mean, that holds a lot and, and see so strong, even Liberians back home and, and, um, and advocate and discussion who really feel passionate about this issue of dual citizenship and there's a need to ensure that our Liberian brothers and sisters here um, be able to do whatever they want to do in Liberia. What, what, it, what you guys can do now is to see how those information can be communicated because one of the key things that the vision um, spoke specifically on was to ensuring that the issue of legal reform. So within the legal reform, the constitutional issues, the constitutionality, and all of those other issues that had some legality have to go through that process. So you can forward all those information, forward all those reasons why it's important, that this is the right and best time to do that. And I can share with you the information. I mean, the head of the Constitution Review Committee is Honorable Gloria Scott, um, Honorable Gloria Scott, who was a former member of parliament. She was a senator, and now, I mean, she didn't win elections, so she's head of the Constitution Review Committee. So all of the things you can do now is to find a means, follow those information, um, find a team, maybe if some of them are coming here, invite them on the diaspora forum, let them talk about this issue and then how this can be part of the Constitution. So at the end of the day, when there is any process of referendum, because at the end of all of the review process, obviously, like our law says, it has to go through referendum, and then there will be elections. Then Liberians here now can mobilize and see to ensure that the issue of dual citizenship is one of the key things that's going to be discussed in the new Constitution. So, I mean, that's what they, they that's how um, Asian 2030 relates, because it didn't say specifically let dual citizenship be clear, but it spoke to the issue of uh, law reform. So because it's a legal process, that's how it goes through those processes. And since the vision suggested of a setting up of a constitutional review committee, that's why the constitutional review committee has been set up. That's why discussion around the constitutional issues has been discussed. So the best time now is for Liberians here and in Liberia and everywhere, like us, who care about this issue of dual citizenship to also contribute their voices. Okay. Thank you. My yeah. next caller will be uh, Mr. Bangali Trawale, calling from Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, I believe. Mr. Trawale, uh, your question for Norma Fofana. Welcome to the Liberian Diaspora for Thank you very much, Mr. Monorito. You got it right. And I'd like to thank our guest tonight. I mean, giving you a whole lot tonight, and I appreciate you for that. Uh, your, phone, your phone is Granny, Mr. Trawale. Oh, okay. Then, uh, hello? Are you hearing me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, better. Well, way better. Thank yep. you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Madam, uh, from the onset, uh, you differentiated this. Vision 2030 from previous vision that ever existed, in that this vision, according to you, is the people's vision, and previous vision was the government vision. If that is right, then uh, a lot of concern that uh, come to people's mind said that in the recent past we had uh, the PRC and uh, PRS, the poverty reduction strategies that was just launched and nothing was ahead of its outcome and then we have this vision territory by the same this same administration. So the concern that I come about is that uh, if this vision is the people's vision, they want to know who pays the staff of this vision. <laughs> and do, <laughs> does the operation cost of this vision reflect in the, nation, the, the current national budget. If all is right, then how could you say this is, of, of, of course, the people's vision, but not the government vision, who has some influence over this vision outcome and show any change of government? What a guarantee that it will not be squashed again the previous vision. Please address yourself to that. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, to just kind of inform him about the processes of the um, poverty reduction strategy, um, just to backdrop a little bit, um, if he said there wasn't a lot, there wasn't anything that was heard uh, of the PRS, then probably he hasn't been following um, 
the, the development trend or the PRS process back home. But however, um, the first, like you mentioned earlier, and somebody even mentioned, um, like you first uh, look at when the, the government got into power, we all know it was it was still in an interim process where we had just come from war, Judy Bryan term has just expired, and elections were held, and then the thing right, right then, because a lot of people were still in, in this place, in refugee camps. And so the, the people had to, the, the first thing was the emergency and relief issues. So instead of focusing on a long-term perspective then, the key issue was a short-term, quick impact project to ensuring that people leave, uh, the people leave the refugee camp, sorry, and then go back to their different homes and get relief items and emergency and water supply and all those little emergency issues that were needed then. So that was the focus. And then uh, there was the interim poverty reduction strategy, which focused uh, on the short-term plan. That was the first, um, in, 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 the interim poverty reduction strategy. So after that, and I was even the poverty reduction strategy paper. But then after that process, which was a very short term, and then then came the, the the first poverty reduction strategy. So the first paper was a short term plan on how to you know go to the emergency, looking at unmill coming unmill, you know all those security issues and making sure that everything is okay, disarmament, you know all those different things. But after after that, there was the poverty reduction strategy. Which was um, which was the um, next term to ensuring that the government achieved its plan agenda. We were still in an emergency state, but it was less now, and there was a need for agriculture um, to making sure that people go back to the, to the farm and make gardens and grow food, and uh, and then look at the, the quick impact different things. And then after after they won, even even with the poverty reduction strategy that he talked that he talked about. I mean, the progress report, according to the progress report, there was the achievement that said it, it was achieved 80%. So, I mean, if he said he hasn't heard a lot about it, I think we should follow more on the processes back home. And then coming to Vision 2030, um, the vision is a long term again. Um, and it is a people's vision, like I mentioned. But if, if I say it's a people's vision, it doesn't mean, okay, it's, it's a people's vision because the people's vision says somewhere lying now and because it's so, it's because there's a statement that says something for everybody is something for nobody because everybody is nobody. It's not a single person. But in terms of operational, there are structure again. So the structure of the vision, like I mentioned, the government, who is the sitting government, will not recuse herself from the entire process. That's why I said earlier on that the co-sponsors, and the co-sponsors, one is the governance commission that is in charge of long-term studies based on their mandate, and there's the Ministry of Planning and Economic Affairs with her own um, mandate in terms of long-term plans, as well as planning the economic um, plans for the country. That has to do with development of the PRS, the Internal Poverty Reduction Strategy, and this agenda for transformation. So, I mean, those are how it, it, it went through. And then, in terms of uh, finance and, and funding, um, obviously, the vision process, especially because the vision has stages. Because it's a research process, Vision 2030, in the beginning, where we our mandate was the core team, the steering committee, the secretariat. Those co sponsors, our initial minute is to ensure that we we come up with the country's vision. So because the country's vision has been derived, we've concluded that component based on the conference that was held in Banga, the, the, the final conference. We have the, we now have the vision. The second stage now has to do with the implementation. So of course you cannot implement the vision without uh, what the government has had, that is the agenda for transformation. So the agenda for transformation now, it is going to ensure that in terms of roads, so if you're implementing the vision, I mean, the Liberian people, I mean, if you say who are the people, the people are people who elected the government. So if the people say we want road infrastructure, so who's responsible for roads? It's the Ministry of Public Works. So the Ministry of Public Works presents her budget, and her budget will include the Liberian people say we want you to fix this road from this point to this point. So when she's doing her budget, she's going to include 
what the Liberian people say. You know, so that's how all of the different sectors work. So in terms of implementation and costs and all that, of course, it's the government based on the different sector approaches that are going to implement the vision. I hope that is understood. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I think that's acceptable. Uh, I think my, uh, I think this is my first female caller. Is it? Mrs. Uh, uh, Kotomo uh, Kamara calling from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Mrs. Uh, Kamara, welcome to the Liberian Diaspora Forum. Your question for Rufufana. Uh, thank you so much. Um, welcome, Mrs. Fufana. We are very happy to have you. Um, Thank you so much for coming on our show. Um, the question I have here, to what extent the Vision 2030 um, focus on increasing employment rate in Liberia? To clarify, what model and structure uh, and strategy the Vision 2030 is using to build human capacity in terms of employment? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think, um, thanks to the first female caller, um, as you mentioned earlier, I'll be excited to hear a lot of female calling, but however, um, we have similar issues in Liberia, but however, um, and the important point that she made in terms of employment and the rate of um, employment in Liberia, what is Vision 2030, what plans Vision 2030 has, that is why, um, like earlier on, a caller mentioned about the issue of the education policy or the education sector, what is specifically happening in that. So um, the employment challenges is huge, my sister. I mean, to just be frank with you, the issue of unemployment is one of the key. So uh, right now what is happening with the Ministry of Labor, so there has been different um, plans to see how the issue of employment can be augmented in terms of professional because they're, they're I mean, and then youth unemployment is so huge. If you look at the context, our country, um, young, a lot of young people were as fighters, and some of them don't have anything to do. Uh, some of them are in the street, uh, snatching phones and doing um, things that are inappropriate or that are criminal minded. But um, there are lots of emphasis that has been happening. So the issue of the vocational and technical um, education with the Ministry of Youth and Sports, they, they're working hard to get a lot of young people to do the technical area that is um, training them in, in the agricultural sector, training, driving. So the Ministry of Gender is also implementing what is called the EPAC project. So the EPAC project is on economic empowerment um, for young women and girls who are, in, who are um, not in school, who are not doing anything, they're just languishing in the street. And then there are different sectors within the Ministry of Labor. Uh, what she does now is to compile all of those information and to ensure and, and advise government to say this is where we have our challenges, this is what we need to do, and even the, the government has this um, small-scale um, work that is given to young people, whether it's road, uh, roadside pressure, whether it's agriculture, with the, there's a YES project, a youth empowerment scheme, where young people can be given those job opportunities to be able to help them. And there is also what we call the President Young Professional Program, um, where the, the government um, works with a lot of young university graduates who graduate from university and they get trained and they get paid at different, in the, in the government, in the public sector, not the private sector. Um, to get played and see how they can work in different ministries and agencies and see how they can transfer that form of knowledge in terms of capacity building. But there are also plans on working um, in, the, um, in the private sector, how to carry on similar modules to see how young people or also people generally to um, work in the areas of the private sector because a huge emphasis is placed on the public sector, which is a challenge because a country cannot develop with the concentration on the public sector. A lot of people need to gain interest in the private sector, how to develop the private sector, because it's the private sector that runs the economy and how um, things will get better. Um, so there are those um, few that I can think at the top of my head in terms of specific what projects or programs are in place right now in the Ministry of Youth and Sports, Labor, Gender, um, um, the president and professional, and 
the, the MBTC program that is ongoing and taking young people off the street. But there are also individuals who have established their organization um, back home that their um, people also getting support from the disaster, also seeing how they can get ex um, child soldiers who are in the street to take them off the street. Like I've known the former general Bud Mitchell, who is now involved into um, into that kind of work, taking young men from the street, going to the ghettos, taking them out, and making sure that they, I mean, they have to get some employable skills as well. But they're generally the issue of unemployment is a challenge. Thank you. Uh, if you just join us, we say welcome to the Liberian Diaspora Forum, Forum Weekly Talk Show. Uh, we have the privilege of hosting the Honorable Co-Chair President of Vision 2030 in Liberia, of course, Honorable Kula V. Fofana. We are well over halfway half mark in the show. We will be uh, joining the show uh, before you know it. Um, I'll take two more questions, and then after that, we will take a quick two minutes break to allow everyone, especially our guests, to have a glass of water, and then we will come and finish the show. My next caller comes from Winnipeg uh, in Canada. Uh, the last mm -hmm. four digits, 1797. Winnipeg, Canada, 1797. Welcome to the Librarian Diaspora Forum. Your question for number four, Fana. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Uh, my name is uh, Abu Dukle, and I'm in Winnipeg, Canada. And I want to, first of all, um, thank uh, Honorable Fofana for taking time out of her very busy schedule to join us tonight. Um, I just have a, a sort of a comment and a question, if time will allow me. Um, I've been listening to Kula explain some aspects of Division 2030, but uh, what concerns me is uh, is that <clears throat> just uh, last week or two weeks ago, the president was in Tunisia attending some conference there, and somebody asked the president about developments and uh, strategies that have been, you know, formulated to put the country forward, and uh, the president reiterated something she said earlier, which is, uh, again, she didn't really realize at first the magnitude of destruction and the need that re that is required to up to build all those things that were destroyed. So having said that and having that in mind, uh, the 2030 vision sounds like a very ambitious uh, uh, objective from this, from this the phase of it just by looking at it, but in practical terms, based on all the eventualities that exist on the ground right now in Liberia, in all sectors, and taking into account the errors that were committed in the past that led to some of the issues we are now struggling to deal with. And I'll just give you one or two examples. For example, uh, the long-term concession contract that was signed uh, during the previous administrations for, 20, for between 30, 50, in some cases, 90 years, and the damage that resulted to, as, to the country as a nation and to the people, with all that factored in and the enormity of the crisis, economic, political, social that we have right now, do you think it's practical in terms of uh, application? Is it practical to actually realize the 2030 objectives, and I'm asking this question simply because uh, my own experience being with the Liberian politics is that bad governance is one of two things. It's either intentional or consequential. And in the case of Liberia, what we see today, and things that have happened in the past that led up to this part today, was a consequence of bad policies and bad governance. Having factored all of this, how realistic is it because right now we are in 2013. We are not too far from 2030, by the way. Mm -hmm. Do you actually think it's practically feasible to even even get started in practical terms to realize 2030? Thank you. Thank you. I think I think you, you made a very salient point, especially um, like pinning it from the current challenges um, within Liberia and what the president had mentioned. Um, but, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I'm one person who, um, though I kind of consider the dark side of things, but I also um, look 
more to the bright side of things and be very optimistic about the development of the country. And in terms of the practical nature of um, achievement of Vision 2030, I think it's very practical. But we all understand it's a tall order. It's a challenge, especially because the, 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 the process of development is not just one person going to do everything, I mean, do it all. It, it is obviously the input from everyone in every, every Liberian, in and outside Liberia, and also those policies. That's why I said earlier, right now, with the process of alignment and realignment, that is, if we are committed, especially when you mention on the issue of long-term um, concession agreement that have been carried out with a practical example of the fire spoon and looking at, I mean, I mean, it is, it is tactical that, Concession agreement over the world doesn't develop a country. Even the, the process of employment doesn't employ a lot of people. I mean, fire is one is one example with all of the things that happen. So because of the challenges we had, we had a long term challenge of that's why we're having all those um trigger down effects today in, in the country. But in terms of the particularity, of course we can achieve vision twenty thirty, specifically when we do those things that we supposed to do. You know, that is, um, this is a functionality process, especially making sure that all structures of the society um, function. So in that case, how do we ensure that the, the, this process of realignment alignment makes sure that um, government and her partners, the USAID, the FDIs, and all those different bilateral and multilateral partners confined to what we want. So if the issue of concession agreement and with innovation has been got a lot of time in during the constitution, Liberian said we do not want people to come and extract our natural resources because these are non renewable. So if you take out the diamonds, the gold and everything and take them out and export them, there's no value addition. So in terms of making sure that we we have to adjust those things and return and take a full reverse from the old order which is we largely depend on um, extractive industry, taking away our raw materials, and ensure that we can make sure that we try to produce those raw materials into finished products. For example, we, we have a practical example with one of the African countries in Botswana. Botswana, which is an African country, has a lot of, um, um, they, they, have, they have a process of addition added. Because what happens, especially looking at value addition, what happens is, if you have the companies, your rubber, your gold, your diamonds, your everything, you know, they're transforming from just being the raw material, so finished products. You're helping to employ, to have you will need skill sets. You have your people between those areas. Then you also have a, a cheaper um, a buying rate. That is, you help to develop the country more, and those things want to live in the country. You know, so other people would depend on Liberia for exporting finished products, not exporting the raw materials, you know. So this is how we all need to, to start adding our voices to say, hey, government, this has to do with all of us thinking differently and acting differently. And acting differently is to leave from the old order before concession agreement are signed, before our lawmakers go to sign those concession agreements. How are the people involved in those discussions? How, what is the benefit? What is the plus and minuses? How do we develop think tanks? Before anything happens, people review these processes and say, this is not going to be good for our country. These are the pros, these are the cons. Let us change it this way and not just leave it to settings for people to make decisions on our behalf. So it's just a whole process of all of us involving and seeking what we want to do, whether it's true, having our discussions around um, policies and programs and concessionaires that are going to be affecting the lives of our people, you know. So basically it's, it's um, in that form. Thank you. I'll take one more caller and then we'll take a quick two minutes break and then we'll return to finish it. Uh, 0755, 0755, the last four digit. Would you please tell us your name, where you're calling from, and your question for uh, Fana? 0755. Yeah, you, uh, this, hello. Hello. Yeah, this is Yaka Abubaka Kuma. Welcome, Mr. Kuma. Yeah, well, uh, I've been off and on, but uh, I keep listening to the very questions that people are uh, responding on and the very answer from the madam. 
Uh, yeah. But I, uh, yeah, I see the whole process. I don't know the questions. That, no, the answers are somehow political to me. Yeah, yeah. because she, yeah, she may mention about the uh, Educational Reform Act, and uh, I don't know uh, because the, the the Educational Reform Act was signed 2011, and I don't know whether it is the same Educational Reform she's talking about. And someone may mention of the uh, yeah, yeah someone may mention of the PROS as the uh, the poverty reduction strategy, and she also mm-hmm. blends that with the 2030 vision. You know, one of their uh, 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 program implemented. So that brought me to a question that says, so but when this vision 2030 started, you know, because we were told that uh, it was uh, endorsed, they gone 20, 2012. Yeah. You know, yeah. So that's the question. So it's like for other other things that are happening, you know, uh, that time. So it's also part of the twenty uh, the twenty thirty vision. So I want to know when, in fact, when it started. Uh, that's my question. And I think I call my name right. Yeah, when yeah, the whole process started. Yeah, but I think can I be online before you know? But she's answering the part there. Well, yeah, by all means, stay on. Thank you. I'm a Fafana. Okay. Yeah, Are you a I politician? Yeah. <laughs> if I'm a politician. Yeah, why well, is he answering every question with politics? So. <laughs> well, I don't know when you talk about answering questions with politics. I'm just being real and frank on things that are happening. So I don't know how okay. politicians answer questions, whether they answer it specific ways. But I'm just answering. I'm just answering it how I mean. I know that except that he has or. Whoever said that has some other way to answer the question they're posting. But however the case is, especially talking of um, when this whole vision started and making mention to the education reform as that I mentioned of 2011, I think it was a good point that he picked um, that up. Um, actually, this entire process started um, specifically, like I mentioned, in, um, in 2003. A lot of times people, um, I mean, don't, kind of know the thing Vision 2020 just started today, but actually it started in 2003 um, when there was a whole discussion um, around concerning the, the teacher studies of, 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 of the world, of Africa, and all these other different discussions happening. And specifically, I mean, with the, even the Millennium Development Goals um, that was set up with the, at the Millennium Summit in 2000 in, at the UN um, headquarters here in, I mean, in the U.S., specifically in New York, so all these different discussions were happening around long-term studies and setting development targets, setting different agendas to ensure that the lives of the people from different places are better. But it took root. You know, in 2003, again, we were still, as a country, we were still in an emergency situation where um, the development during the Accra um, conference in, in Ghana, the Accra Peace Agreement, where discussion emerged about the formation of the Governance Commission. So with the formation of the Governance Commission, where uh, Madame Choli then was the first um, head of the, it was, at then it was the Governance um, Reform Commission, where um, there was also discussion about the mandate of uh, the Governance Reform Commission that speaks uh, specifically to the issue of teacher studies and to see um, how the issue of our governance challenges, what happened before, how do we proper long-term policies to move ahead, you know? So with that, that's when the discussion, so it started off with having um, different discussion and then set up having concept notes. But again, like I mentioned, we were so in a time of fragile nation, that is where the issue of emergency, even in 2003, there was still uh, Nazareth Claire, uh, President Taylor, um, to leave, you know, all those kind of were still in the war and it was still a hot season, so there was not a, enough time to have a discussion around long term studies. And then after that, um, it didn't pick up because, again, after 2003, after elections and in 2005, um, again, we're still in an emergency situation where people were still trying to put back their lives together, so there was still a need for quick impact, like I mentioned earlier. And then in 2010, you know, so it started in 2010 with uh, the, the completion of the concept paper where even the, the, one of the consultants, I didn't, I didn't mention on um, before, 
um, the, 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 the Institute for Teacher Studies in Africa, that is the African Teachers Institute is based in South Africa, was also one of, one of the key consultants that they spoke about it, helping us develop the methodology um, based on the work they've done in other countries and other places on teacher studies and, and how the practices go, and then also scenarios, construction, and all that. So when those ones happened, um, then discussion emerged. Even there were meetings with political parties, there were meetings with different actors, there were meetings, and then they started, they started, started. But at, at the end of 2010 and then in 2011, um, you know, everybody knew it was um, the issue of the election. So specifically, in one of the meetings with the political parties, the political parties themselves suggested that, hey, we know 2011 is a political season, and we do not want to see this process so that this government will use this um, Vision 2030 process to say it's a, Trump, it's a campaign Trump card to say, oh, the government is doing X, Y, Z. So that's how the process was slowed down. So, so they all suggested that this process stop until after the elections, then the discussion can still pick up because all those discussions have been happening. And now, again, like I mentioned, you cannot stop the whole government and whole discussions from ongoing. So at the, after the elections, there were even we as um, steering committee members came in in February of 2012, how we all got involved um, as steering committee members because then it was with the core team, um, the secretariat, the coordinators trying to do the base study, talking to different groups, and then with these processes ongoing, um, with the education process as well, um, seeing how there was a need to do the to reform the education law and have even these uh, these discussions are ongoing, all help to feed into one another to say this is the trend is going. So that's how, and even with the education um, reform law, they're also finding a means of alignment and realignment. So the president started today. We started things in 2000 with the whole Millennium Development Goal discussion. I mean, the Millennium Summit discussion at the UN, also with the 2003 when we were putting our lives back together after running around, um, refugee and displaced, people lost in their lives, and it took whole, whole thing in 20, at the, I mean, after the elections in 2012 um, when we concluded having all these different constitutions, but there's practices happening throughout those times. Thank you. We will return, folks. We'll take a two minutes break Everybody fight, body my fucking ball. The only time I fucking ball when it got get it all. The struggle keep killing me, I ain't even got dog. I got the hustle, how to buy my baby rubber doll. The economic system by a fool, yet I get her rap. Papa said was growing hot, so I gotta speak the fight. You think I'm talking crap? No, I'm talking rap. Just the survivors, why my days are doing old school. Some people say we fool, some people say we go to school. Some people still asking, what are you doing for the youth? The government breaking, so the youth is still checking. No, it's a team, and so we're making no money. I'm telling this to y'all, I ain't having no job. That's what I stand for, my father can't ball. Who feels I'm a school, but my heart's not falling. For Russia in the city, I'm gonna keep you turned up. But my heart's not falling. Surely, say, she be living me tonight. But my heart's not falling. Good evening and once again welcome to the Liberian Diaspora Forum Weekly Talk Show. Uh, tonight we I have the honor of hosting Honorable Kula V. Da, Kula v. Fofana, excuse me, 
the co-chair for Vision 2030, and we are just warning down the show. We've been here a little over two hours now. I guess it's on the East Coast. You can imagine how late, how much later it will be there. So with that said, we'll take our many questions here, and uh, we will get uh, out of here as soon as possible. I will take uh, our next caller. Hmm. Our next caller. Mr. Isaac Harris, calling from Crystal, Minnesota. Mr. Harris, uh, welcome to the Liberian Diaspora Forum. Your question for Honorable um, Fafana. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I start sitting here and listening to the chairman being so eloquent and in her presentation. I just have one question. Actually, it's a follow-up question from my brother. Oh, Isaac, Isaac, the, the, the guest is not hearing you well. Can you be a little... Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, I think it's a little better now. Uh, yeah. Okay, I say after about two hours listening to you so eloquently speaking and presenting on Vision 2030. It's just a follow-up question to one of the callers that called from Canada. My question is, what would be some indicators showing that Vision 2030 is or has been successful? Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Yeah, I think that's a key, um, that's a key point he, he asked. And specifically, in terms of measuring impact and measuring the key indicators, especially looking at it from a monitoring and evaluation perspective, um, like someone mentioned, there has already um, been set up the Liberia Development Alliance. So the Liberian Development Alliance role is to review all of the achievements of the current Vision 2030 um, Specifically with those development agenda, the agenda for transformation, the Roma for reconciliation, and say between now and this time, what have you achieved? What are the challenges? Why you haven't reached to this point? You know. So right now, we just adopted a vision in 2012, so it's just three months. So uh, we're still trying to finalize all of the different uh, roles and responsibilities, pushing and making sure everything is on course and then start um, the implementation, but implementation of some of the different things. So the specific indicators will be developed by the LDA and say, okay, to, to, measure, um, to measure the impact of in the education sector, these are the indicators we're going to look at, whether it's the number of schools, whether it's the number of students, whether it's the quality of the education, whether it's going to be qualitative measurement or quantitative measurement. So they're going to, like, look at a whole range of um, different um, indicators. So there's not, like, one single specific indicator. So there's, there are a whole range of different indicators to measure all of the different achievements in, in, in where we are in terms of a Vision 2030. Thank you. I'm not sure which era code is 412, uh, but your last four digits, 9271, 9271. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from and your question for Honorable Fofana? 9271. Yeah, yeah, my name is Joy. Total, I'm calling from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Welcome to the show. Yeah, uh, thank you also, uh, Madam Fofana. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, first of all, let me commend you. You are very eloquent. Uh, you know, you speak very clearly. And I don't want to... I don't know if it's been to a personal, but what is your background? You know, in terms of educational background and how, <laughs> and how, and how you were appointed or selected to that position. <laughs> the, 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 second, the second concern I have, when I was in Liberia last year, I attended a presentation at Planning Ministry, the Good Governor Commission, the one I had about the Australia. They did a good presentation about good governance in Liberia, mm -hmm. and also the Vision Theory Summit. So I'm a little bit confused. I don't know how these two entities really working. What are they taking? Whether they are taking resources from the Good Governance Commission to be part of their Vision Theory, or maybe you could just clear my dad on these two, on the two stuff. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. In terms of the, the second question on um, Dr. Sawyer or the Governance Commission making a presentation, um, I, didn't, I mean, I didn't quite get it, but it is because what I know the Governance Commission does is they have this 
regular ongoing um, different discussion, we have the policy dialogue that goes on where different um, departments, different um, institutions, different ministries come and present to public, invite different segments of the public, whether it's um, local youth, um, uh, people working in the um, other sectors, that is the development partners and all those other people, bringing them together and talking about this policy and all that. So I have attended several of their policy dialogues. So I don't know whether that was one of the discussions that were ongoing. Um, so I don't, I don't know the fact about that one. But it is specifically on um, what the um, what the governance commission, the, re the relationship between the governance commission and the Ministry of planning on this vision, like I mentioned earlier, both mandates has a lot to do with future studies and planning for the country. So that is why they're involved. That is why they're co-sponsors representing the government on this whole process as co-sponsors and ex-officials of the steering committee. Um, and then on the issue of my background, um, <laughs> um, okay. Uh, like, obvious, like, obvious, obviously, he wasn't here when I read your profile. <laughs> Okay. I know, right? Yeah, so I, I will kind of understand that. But I, I studied mass communication um, at the American Methodist Episcopal University, so I have a bachelor's in mass communication. But I have done several um, different trainings in different disciplines um, in um, future studies, in development, in gender, in advocacy. Because, okay, my background is I'm an advocate, so uh, I work as a community organizer. So, so with all of those ones. And then in terms of how I got um, involved or how I got appointed, um, I wouldn't know because what actually happened was it was on February 7th. I was sleeping around 7 a.m. and my phone rang. And one of the journalists, because normally they, they read it early morning news, first thing 7 o'clock on Tuesday FM, and this journalist called to confirm because he had seen the list of those who have been appointed as uh, members of the steering committee. And I was the young person to be co-chair to Dr. Topana Tipote, and he was asking whether this is the Kula Fofana that he knows, um, and whether it's the Kula Fofana that he knows that has been appointed as co-chair on the vision steering committee. And I said, no, I'm not the one. Um, but after the news, he, then someone like said, oh, you you should be the one. You are the one. You are the one. And after the news, I received calls that, oh, yeah, you have been and this and that and the rest of it. So, I mean, because it, because my work is in advocacy, is in community work, is in working with people at community level. So I thought it was uh, a responsibility or a call to action or a call to duty to work for the Liberian people, though I've been working um, in, for the Liberian people for the longest um, since I was very young, though I'm still young, but since I was seven, I'm working in those areas. So I just thought that this was an opportunity to help contribute on a bigger uh, long-term perspective. So that's how I got involved. I didn't know how. So I decided to find out how, but someone said, okay, based on all of the work you've been doing in the community and as a youth advocate and a youth leader, it was important to have a young person involved with this whole practice. That's how you got nominated and president appointed you. So that's, how, that's what I know so far. Probably there are other information there, but me too, I was surprised. And then, no, I, I mean, at first when I said the news, I was in, like, you know, I didn't know I was the one. Yeah, the same with you. Okay, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a Mayu, Mayu Belete. I'm a Mayu Belete from uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, your question for Amber Fofana. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for having me on the show. Um, I, I will call uh, the guest by different name. How are you, uh, Madam Samis? Uh, yeah, uh, this is my... Uh, caution. Recently, a group of women submitted a bill before the national legislature calling for higher women participation in government, especially 30 percent. Is there anything in the digital alternative that, takes, uh, that talks about women's uh, participation in government, and uh, especially the 30 percent of uh, Modi or whatsoever? Yeah. And how does that protect and respect the constitutional level? We also guarantee uh, uh, equal. equal yeah, uh, equal job uh, based of uh, equal access to employment based of uh, uh, regardless of your gender, ethnicity, sure. or whatever. Okay, uh, I just want us to use this uh, teleconference tool as a case study, just uh, uh, as an example. There are a lot of women on the line, they are not dying, start this one just to ask questions. So, how do you, you also apply that to the government, even if you want to give 30%, they are not ready to, to come forward. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sability. Oh, all right. Thank you very much. Okay. So 
you know, gender issues and, you know, I've been involved in this for quite some time. Again, I don't want to take, because if we start going into why 30%, why there's women, why, because even me, I'm part of that advocacy to showing that there is 30% representation for women across, especially in terms of um, the development process. But specifically what um, Vision 2030 said about that, what Vision 2030 said was, or is, that every Liberian in Liberia should be given equal opportunity, you know, so, but what equal opportunity means, you know? So, again, I don't want to, like, go long because this is going to be another long conversation on um, women's participation in, in equity and all that and 30% representation. But if you follow the, the, the development trend, now, from day one, the Liberian Constitution says everyone is equal, right? And women, men, children, boys, girls, everybody equal, equal access and everything. But have we thought to kind of think, why though it is equal, but what have been the challenges of women not having not participating or women not giving it the chance to, to participate because the, the the constitution says everybody equal. But why was women given the right to vote in nineteen forty eight since Liberia got an independence in eighteen forty seven? Why was that so? Why is it that uh okay, women like like the very good analogy that he gave that there is this program ongoing and the men calling and women are not calling. Why? Do we have we like thought to, to understand beyond just okay, this is it, and then women don't, do not need that. So it is just more than that. Have we thought to ask why the, the why the girls why there are less girls in in, in schools or uh, in in more girls why there are girls dropping out of school because of early pregnancy? Have we thought to say okay, women in leadership? Um, there are few women in the house or in the, in the, in the lower and upper houses that are, that are they're not contributing. Do we have we thought to think why? There are lots of barriers. Though the constitution says everybody is equal, but what is it that is stopping women from participating? Now, if you if you ask yourself those questions and try to understand why it is why is it the way it is, you get to understand that there's several challenges. One has to do with the economic challenges. First of all, there are women who work more, women who in fact have more jobs than the professional men. How? Because most of the women, especially in Liberia, well, because there are other developed countries that people work, especially in the home, there are men who they the important to help the women take care of the home as well. But especially in Liberia that we're looking at and talking about, um, even if you're a professional woman, you are expected to go to work, do your eight hours or whatever hours you're working for, and go back home and cook and take care of your children and do all of that. So the time the men will take to go to the high centers and have a discussion, the woman is there who is taking care of the household chores because that's her second unpaid job that she's supposed to do, a full-time unpaid job that she's supposed to do. And then in terms of participating in elections, what, what is stopping? Studies have shown that ma- majority of a woman's assets, especially financial uh, uh, um, um, achievement or income, are paid towards home and then Less is care for herself or to take care of herself. She, she cares about how her children uh, are maintained, their clothes, their food, their health, and everything is okay before she even thinks about herself, how she has to make sure her house is clean and all that before she thinks about herself. So all this income that's needed for political participation, she won't have it. She needs the money to be able to run her campaign, to lobby and do other things. Again, I don't want us to sway this whole discussion on being a white third person, but I think the issue of representation of women is how time that we look beyond just, okay, the Constitution says 50% only or is equal, so everything should be equal. But the reason why international standards that are set, because this quota system is not only based in Liberia, like Uganda right now has a very good parliament where women are in leadership, giving women the, the, the opportunities to participate. So if you have barriers that are stopping women from participating, how do we look in depth and discuss how do we work with those barriers in making sure that women have equal access as it is said within the Constitution? Thank you. Uh- Folks, I ask that you don't make any more new entry. We will just take the remaining questions that are here so we can get our guests out of here. For we all know that's the only way we'll be successful in getting our back on uh, on the show next time. Uh, the next caller will be Musa Sisse, uh, I believe from Minnesota, 952 Bloomington, Minnesota. Musa Sisse, uh, welcome to the Liberian Diaspora Forum. Your question for Rufafana. Oh, that's nice. Hello? 
Yeah, hello. Sorry, I didn't know I was the one. Uh, my name is Mabina Cisse Komara, and I'm calling from Minneapolis, Minnesota, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Um, good evening. Welcome. Hello, Dr. Fana. Yeah. Um, I've been off and on on this line, but my question tonight is that um, what would be some of the indicators that Vision 2013, Vision 2030 is working in an educational setting? Since, you know, education is a major problem in Liberia today. So what are some of the things that Vision Terry will be looking at, looking for in the education setting? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's an important question. Um, some of the things that Vision 2030 will be looking forward is um, to making sure that our education today commensurates with the needs of the country. So th by that I mean... If we if we have we surrounded by water, we surrounded by the ocean, we surrounded by all these different things. We have land, we have all these um, I mean things that we need, um, all the technical know-how. Our education system should conform to that, so that when we put out graduates from the University of Liberia, from AMEU, from all those high education and Washington and everywhere, they will be able to impact the community in the country by making sure that those form of education is working. And that, I mean, I tell you today, there are schools and universities in high school using 1950s and the 80s books and doing history that is not our history. Even you, you it was surprising yeah. to know that there are people who in who in um, schools that do not even understand the Liberian history. Civics is not taught in school, but they, they're doing the American Revolution, the French Revolution, you know, all those kinds of things that do not commensurate with our current day. So one thing that Vision 2030 will be, will, will want to see, especially at, at that point in time, is to see how our education sector is meet up with the needs of the country in all of the sector, whether it's primary education, to tertiary education, to vocational education, technical education, all those areas, even the soft sector as well, all those education needed. Thank you. Uh, before I take the next call, and trust me, we have got just few uh, few questions remaining. We will we'll get you out of here uh, fairly quickly. Uh, you know, last week the guest before you was uh, the Honorable Minister of Gender and Development. And listening to you, I you know I can see a lot of similarity between you two in terms of what you are doing in Liberia and your and the things that you are passionate about. Uh, and which happens to be women's right, women's right, women's right, women's right, uh, which is a great thing. Uh, the minister believes in that so much that apparently she has come to define gender to be women, uh, when in fact uh, men can also be included in that. Now, for a country that elected Africa's first female president, a country that has women's participation in politics documented as far back as who knows when, uh, with all of these things about women rights, are you are you people implying or suggesting that there's some sort of uh, you know injustice, some oppression you know by Liberian men towards Liberian women? Is that what all of these advocates say about uh, women right, women right? Is on is on going? Okay, first of all, um, every everyone who's in Liberia who's involved into different advocates, they have their own reasons for which they involved into those advocates. And for me, the reason for which I'm involved in the, the women's rights advocacy is it might be based on something different from why she is. But because we're bringing both of us together, um, I don't know, but I, w I didn't listen to that edition, but I'm not sure the minister uh, meant that gender, she defines gender as women or women. But in my, in, my, in my own understanding, gender means both male and female. That is very clear. Gender is it, it's not woman, it's not male, it's both male and female. So this, I mean that if we understand the concept of gender and why all these gender advocates started, we will understand why there's a need to have discussion around women's issues. Because, like I mentioned, on why women were all, because even even those of, of us who are so religious who understand the Bible, the Quran, and other, other religious concepts, people understand the first thing you know, there was Adam, and God created Eve, you know. So it means that gender started way back then, you know, because God didn't create Adam and created another man. God created Adam and Eve. So that was where gender started. And then um, I read before that even the whole discussion on um, this whole, the society, most society, in fact, were all 
all uh, um, decided based on um, the women. That is, the woman was the women were all the queens. That's why even today you have Elizabeth or the queen in England. They're always a female. In other other places, other dynasties, you have Cleopatra and all those people. But because of those, things, but then what happened now? The whole paradigm changed, and men started deciding um, what this whole what this whole uh, role, because when roles started playing, interplaying in roles and responsibility, a woman is supposed to be looked at a certain way, a woman is supposed to be uh, looked at in a biological form where her duty is to produce children and to take care of home and to be that soft side and be so calm and be so easy and quiet. And the men are supposed to be the, the strong one and be very frightened. Even sometimes when they're young boys or young children who look soft, they say, oh, you buy your mama, baby, you know, the way like grown people would put it, you know, or you, 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 the girl, you know, growing up, or you want to be like your mom or, you know, stuff like that. But, you know, with the, with the socialization of society, putting women and men in certain roles, deciding what men should do, what women should do, all help to contribute to the uh, gender left behind thing of the women because a lot of times women were not involved into all these discussions. Even if you if you if you go way back in why women were not getting chance to vote in Liberia, you know, some reasons were so and then before a woman votes you have to have permission from your husband, you have to throw some before you even go to school. Even right in our in our families, I mean my my, my grandparents, my grandmom I mean my father were the first generation of people who went to school. So if you have all those kinds of things where women were looked at as, okay, women change that will not live on the road. So even though the Constitution then says gender balance, okay, fifty everybody equal, but people are still not giving uh, opportunity to vote. People are still not giving opportunity to go to school. So if a first, if parents have two children, okay, they say, okay, the boy will be the one to go to school. The girl, somebody will come and, and marry her off. And one of the reasons have been, the boy child um, has, well, the family name will remain. So if your son is, is Lami Kamara, for instance, if he marries, he's going to marry, if he marries one, Fatu or Amina, for last name is going to be Kamara. And then wh- whatever our last name was, will he raise eventually. So that's how all these things, women have been left behind. So because of all these challenges, gender still means men and women. But how do we ensure that more women go to school how do we ensure that we advocate? Because if a man is way ahead, a lot of men are educated, a lot of men are involved. How do we ensure we make sure that women get as well get involved? That's why all these advocates are making sure that preparing women, discussing it, telling women, telling parents that it is important to send a girl child to school because if you send a girl child to school, she will be educated, she will help the family, she will do X, Y, Z. So because of all these discussions and advocates, that's why you have to date women are involved. So even having a first female, that is why it was so like, wow. When Liberia elected the first female president of Africa, everybody was like, wow. Congratulations, Liberia. You know, but it doesn't mean because Liberia has elected a first female president of Africa, so everything is okay with the women's movement. Of course not. There are still challenges. Girls are still dropping out of school. How do we ensure that our schools Make sure that even if a girl is pregnant, how do we have specialized programs for girls who are dropping out of school so they can drop out of school and not do anything else? Or how do we ensure that these um, people who do not have opportunities, these girls who have opportunities, because if you look at the biological makeup of a girl and a boy, the chances are that if a girl drops out of school this time, the possibility of her going back to school and looking at her social condition, her community, her family line, and everything else is not strong and okay, of course, she's not going to go back to school, and it's not going to be good for the economy. It's going to put a hell of a stream on the economy and because the money the government is supposed to use to make sure that they do other things they'll be using in the health sector because more girls are getting pregnant, more girls are having abortion, more girls are getting sick, so there'll be a need to pay some money to that area. So, I mean, it's a long discussion, so I'm not sure I want us to, like, discuss the whole thing, but... <laughs> no, I mean, just, 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 just for the record, uh, I wasn't saying that the minister defined gender as male owner, but just the number of examples she gave that her ministry is involved in were predominantly young women, young women, young women. But I know she knows the definition of gender, just for the record. I wasn't saying that by any means. And unfortunately, a lot of the things that you've just alluded to were now, were now uh, limited to Liberia. Even the great United States, women only started... Yeah. Just, just, just join the workforce like few, few decades ago. Anyway, we will take the next caller here. Uh, uh, 
Ambrosese has been waiting for a very long time. Um, Ambrosese, you want to keep it very brief uh, with your follow-up question so we can get our guests out of here. Uh, it's an investment for next time, so please keep it brief. Mr. Ambrosese, welcome back to the Diaspora Forum. I will do that. Thank, thank you so much. I, I think uh, probably I'm the only one on the opposite side. Uh, uh, and also, Madam Fofana, uh, you are not the only one. Sometimes I ask tough questions whenever people come, including your your your, your finance minister, uh, even when they set up PRS uh, uh, vision, uh, poverty reduction strategies, I ask him some tough questions. I was not the only one that I could disagree with him. So I'm maybe because of the way we look at Liberia. I look at Liberia differently. And if you look at 1993 report, when they were talking about debt relief, uh, the world economists, the date is steady on 200 countries, including the United States of America and Liberia. And they said they are, they are, they are, they are, they are funding was Liberia does not need debt relief. You so say we got everything. But what we lack is good governance. Oh. Now, you go to 1993, if you go to just Google search, 1993, Liberia debt release. Even though they released all our debt, more than $5 billion. But now today, we have accumulated more debt again. We are still surpassed the $5 billion, But we cannot see mm-hmm. anything. But according to you, on this land today, you say the PRS has poverty reduction strategies. Eighty percent have been accomplished. Eighty percent. So I kind of I'm astonished to hear that that eighty percent of PRS uh, 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 have been accomplished. And if you look on the PRS, if you look uh, what PRS really is intended for, like we're talking about role, we're talking about Taking people from living on a wonder a bay, at least to be able to have a minimum wage. We don't see that. And we talk about on a PRS, on a PRS, uh, if, uh, what PRS is intended to do. I'm just trying to really uh, bring everything so that we can understand if 80% of it has been accomplished or it's just uh, a report sent to the donor. Because that's what I've that, that's what has been going on in Liberia. We read a very nice project, and at the end of the day, the money is given, and then we pocket the money, and the work is not being done. Today, you go to Liberia, there's no role. I want to compare Liberia, and the PRS was actually adapted from the Akami. We talk, so many, these are very important, things, and we're now going to the that's, new issue. That's a very good question, Mr. Mm-hmm. That's a very good question. Uh, yes. Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah, yeah, let's I mean, give a chance to quickly address yeah, yourself. Please, please, we please. way past yeah, we've way past time. So, uh, Amber Fofana. Yes, um, I kind of he was kind of breaking in at a certain point, but what I gather from what he was um, talking about is he's astonished on what I mentioned that the PRS um, uh, achieved eighty percent. Eighty percent. Now, what I was saying is the caller earlier on had said that he hasn't heard anything about the PRS. So that's why I was explaining what the government has said. So if he also cares, like he mentioned on the 1993 um, report on Liberia, if he can also go to Google and go check out the progress of the first PRS or the PRS, the first PRS that, 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 had the, the, that concluded in, in, that was supposed to end in December 2011. So he can also go there and go check it out. Because what I'm saying was, the Minister of Planning says the PRS achieves 80%. So this is not Kula for Finance saying PRS achieves 80%. It's the Minister of Planning. And I can myself. So you can follow that or you can even check on the Minister of Planning's website and ask questions to those relevant people again. So, so that's why I was just saying those are information that, are, that came out of the PRS because a caller mentioned that there is not information concerning the PRS. And then the second point about um, um I didn't get really get this last point. Could you help me? Well, it was just going you know uh, along the same way that if eighty percent of the uh, 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 PRS you know mm-hmm. uh, go uh, objectives have been accomplished, and yet we have people in Liberia who are still living on a uh, below poverty line, living on a oh. over uh, uh, with less than a dollar, no roads, no safe drinking water, no hospital. How can we possibly you know? 
uh, oh, measure okay. or agree that you know uh, eighty percent of PRS objectives have been accomplished, achieved. Okay, yeah. So that's why I said he can also Google that and check that out on um, Liberia update or or progress report on PRS one because this is not for me. This is what the government has said. And again, if you can talk to the relevant authority at the Ministry of Planning, or even even with that back then, we weren't even involved with the vision then. So there was a lot of discussion on what is similar uh, similar issues having why is it 80 percent and this is happening. But they were actually more in depth on uh, on what do they mean if they say 80 percent um, represents. I mean, 80 percent um, of the PRS has been achieved. So. It's basically that. So this is not my makeup. This is just what it is. This is what they have said. So I didn't do like a counter checking on all those indicators they've mentioned, whether they actually commensurate with the number they, they're thinking for. So, yeah, so that's, I was just providing information on what I've heard and what I've seen and what I've read in the papers on the, PR, the um, PRS achievement. Yeah. Thank you. First, I'll just take three more questions, and that will do it for tonight. And the rest of you who just uh, 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 entering questions, I'm afraid we will not have time to take your questions. We've way past the limit of our official time, and we want to apologize to our guests for that. So, and uh, my apologies to you as well. Uh, Mr. Dukla from Winnipeg apparently wants to make a quick follow-up. Mr. Dukla, welcome back to the forum. Please keep it brief. Yeah, thank you very much, uh Mr. Moderator, and once again, my thanks and appreciation to uh, Ms. Quilla for the eloquence and the extreme uh, intelligence she's exhibited in responding to those questions. And, you know, again, this is sort of a follow-up to what I had said earlier. You know, um, some of the things that we're dis- discussing tonight, is in it doesn't really have nothing to do with you as an individual, Kula. Uh, but we all love Mama Liberia so much, and we care. That's why we are being critical in what we say. You see, uh, I just want to point a few things out in to sub, sort of a substantiate some of the claims I'm going to make uh, regarding the uh, 2030 future. You see, uh, just to start with the uh, poverty reduction strategy you were talking about, um, I, will, I will tell you uh, all the numbers and things that were mentioned as you said earlier, they were all meant for short-term, uh, you know, uh, de- deliverable or achievable, whatever it was. But the fact remains, and one one specific reason I will give you about that is that there is a number of enrollment in schools that are mentioned in a poverty reduction strategy in the education sector. Only the number, particularly female students that were registered uh, during that time period that was covered. What the, what the number doesn't say in the number mentioned, how many of those numbers remain in, in, in school to the, to, up to the time when that report was written? It doesn't say that. So what I'm simply trying to say here is that those numbers were extremely misleading. That's one. Two, coming to the uh, 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 extractive sector, the process, even by the president herself, has acknowledged that the process has been flawed. It has not yielded the intended outcome as expected, and with, with, with all that coming to the hospitals, you know, our primary roles not, not in good shape, et cetera, et cetera, and up to date, there has been from 2006 since President Sereb came to power, to date, there has been 16 billion United States dollars that have come to Liberia, and if you take our country size into account, the economy of our nation into account, and all the things that have happened from 2006 to date, and look at the, 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 the $16 billion that have come to Liberia and see what have been achieved. And, and, and this is no secret that a significant amount of that, 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 that 16, $16 billion has been mismanaged, has been misspent, et cetera, et cetera. And coupled with the fact that the idea should have been to build institutions so that if, if Madam President is not there tomorrow, whoever comes will continue through those institutions. But the fact remains that in the Republic of Liberia, the governance surrounds around individuals, not institutions. And in Salif's case, it had not proven to be any different. I heard you mention 
Botswana as an example in the extractive industry or sector, what the Salif government don't tell people, Botswana is one of the most stable nations on the continent in terms of justice, social programs, you name it. And it's been like that since 1971. That's about 40 years or so. So I think the government is always selective in telling us achievements and not telling us the shortcomings. My point here is the foundation laid by the current government is flawed. It's a flawed foundation. What's going to happen? And um, Mr. Dupler, keep it brief. So yeah. I guess in, if you want, if you got a question, yeah. So my question is, having factored all of what I've just said, again, if you can even account for how many girls are in school based on your own uh, oh, poverty reduction strategy. I can't hear you. I'm not hearing you. Hello? Is, are you hearing me? You're breaking Hello? me. You're coming in broken. Are you hearing me yes, now? Wow. Line is bad. Uh, are is you hearing? Better? Hello? Okay. okay. Yeah. You, is it much better? Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Hello, are you hearing me? Mr. Foto, do you hear me? I'm hearing, I'm hearing, um, okay. on, but I'm all, wondering. All right. uh, yeah, Mr. Dukla, just, uh, yeah, uh, what's the question? Maybe I can relate it to her. Uh, okay, my question is, with all what I've just mentioned and the lack of progress in the labor sector in terms of labor law, in terms of labor practice. I'm not practice, hearing the question at all, except for the other told me what to Yeah, say. with all of that, how, how practical, again, is it that you think we can arrive at Vision 2030 as it has been anticipated? Uh, so did you get a question? Yeah, he's just asking about the practicality of the achievement of Vision 2030, right? Yeah, in keeping with all the reality, you know, that, yeah, uh, all yeah, the, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, thank you, thank you. I think he made some brilliant um, points. Um, but, again, in terms of, say, because I am one person that before I counter any argument, before I say this is not working, this is not true, this is false, I must have investigated. I must have um, checked and have done my counter uh, information um, or packaging and making sure that all of my facts are correct. How be it? Um, in terms of he mentioned on the issue of the um, education process and the rate of education when it's leading and all that, I cannot say that because I didn't do any further follow-up research to, to see whether the information has been provided, whether it's true or it's misleading. You know, the challenge with Liberia, especially looking at um, the challenges that are so enormous, if you look at in the educational sector, the issue of schools, because you go to some of the schools, I've been to, to some of the schools in, in, out of, out of uh, Monrovia or even Monserrado, where kids are literally sitting under the tree, you know, but it doesn't mean that there hasn't been um, strides made in other areas and even in the education sector in other counties or in other communities. So uh, with all of those numbers, again, I haven't done like a counter um, um, argument to say this is not true, this is misleading or so and so. So I would just leave that as he mentioned, except if, if he can like provide whatever, on what basis he, he's coming with this information. And then the second thing on the issue of the money, like he mentioned, the 16 billion that have come to Liberia. Again, on all these international development points, um, as far as my involvement with all these development issues is concerned, is most times, especially these money that are coming to um, so different developing countries, come with specific mandate and specific focus on, okay, this amount should go to this area and this amount should go to that area. So if you have been following how the money has been extended and which area, whether they are sitting which one, because he also mentioned that a uh, majority of the money was eating and all that. So I don't know how the report process of those who are giving their money goes on, whether they just give their money and does it, they don't expect and they don't evaluate the information they're receiving from whoever they've given the money to, whether it's government or government institution. Um, and then he mentioned that the funds have been mismanaged. So I cannot say that for a fact because, again, I haven't done like a counter investigation on the 16 billion, as you mentioned, that, was, uh, that has been given to Liberia and which area it has been used in. But as far as I, I know and the information that I've gathered, in terms of building institutions, as you mentioned, um, whether that all oh, things are not happening, um, being very much looking at the dark side and nothing is happening and roads are not constructed and all that, but to be to be frank with you, I mean to just give in terms of information that I know, um, there has been 
some institution developments again. One has to do with the issue of the Governance Commission, looking at the issue of decentralization. All of us here will agree that the issue of decentralization is a huge challenge. That is, um, in terms of decentralizing government, no, no, Monrovia should not be like the area, though it's a central point. How do you ensure that the local government, the issue of payment and teachers and all that, do not come to everybody, don't come to Monrovia, but things decentralize the local government and cheese and, and, and whoever at the level and decentralizing government wherein you have um, labor ministries, gender, whatever, all those infrastructure or all those ministries go to the community in the counties where people can work on those areas. Um, I know that there, there has been, based on the establishment of the Governance Commission, there is a huge process of decentralization um, discussion and, and process going on in, in, in Liberia. And also, uh, there has been the establishment of the GAC, that is the General Auditing Commission. Um, that is an institution that has been um, established to ensure that uh, the process of auditing, making sure we're tracking the fund issue of corruption and all that. That's why you even hear a lot of corruption cases before then, I mean, with, because there was not GAC and other, other institutions, we didn't have people tracking on um, how much money goes to this other ministry and who, which minister has embezzled. And, you know, just to have the information, I mean, that's a step in, in, a, in a good direction. Also, the process of the establishment of the LSTC, that is the Liberia Anti-Corruption Commission. I know for a fact that the establishment of the Liberia Anti-Corruption -Com Commission is also been established. Though there are still challenges in this institution that needs to be strengthened, but there, because with the mere fact of its establishment, that shows a process of um, continuation. There's, there's some green light at the end of um, the tunnel. Um, yeah, so in terms of practically, I think um, instead of us just sitting on the fence and saying, oh, it's not going to work, or oh, well, it's not possible looking at all the challenges in Liberia, because the challenges of Liberia is so huge, it's like the ocean and then one drop will appear as though nothing happens. So what do we do as, as Liberians in the diaspora, in Liberia, other places? How do we make sure that our voices, even if it's just being very critical of government, and not just sitting on the fence and saying, oh, it's not going to work, or let's just see what's going to happen, what is your suggestion? Okay, if I say this is not going to work, I must have a suggestion that will make it work. So if because it is, for example, if I have a bottle that, that is white and I say, and everybody's trying to make it red and I say it's not going to work, I should bring a suggestion to say, okay, the only way this thing can work if you do X, Y, Z. Maybe if you put, if you put some red coloring or something on it to make it red, you know? So if I come with that form, of, of suggestion and not just being very um, cynical or being very uh, sitting on the fence to say it's not going to work. Of course it's not going to work if you don't bring your ideas that will make it work. So it's better for us Liberians, since we, we all know we one of the oldest on the continent and we have less to show, how do we hold government accountable? How do we hold ourselves accountable? How do we ask questions? How do we not just sit one place and say it's not going to work or this person is not doing anything, everybody is corrupt and this and that and all of that. Instead of just doing that, let us do something constructive. Get together, say, hey, government, you want to do X, Y, Z, but it's not going to work because of X, Y, Z. How do we make sure that it works if we do this and this and this? Even though if your point is not well taken, but the mere, for the mere fact that you suggested, of course, anybody who's doing something and they got some critics, they will obviously listen to what the critics have to say and to see what things can be made out of that. So what I can tell my brother is that I sincerely do understand all of his comments he's making and, and, you know, and saying that the practicality, the vision is an, is an ambition. Of course, it's an ambitious vision, but how do we make this ambition a reality? It's for you, myself, everybody else getting involved and say, this is our suggestion for moving forward. Thank you. Honorable uh, Fana, what I'm going to do here, uh, we'll uh, take the last person and then I'll let you, I'll let you answer that in, uh, while in, uh, making your closing remarks. And, uh, and uh, I'll take the, just two simple or short questions out of these uh, multiple test message questions that are here, and so that way we can uh, call it a night. The two short test questions will be then... Uh, Somebody asked since uh, since you got a phone call and, uh, and was informed that you you were being appointed as uh, the co-chair for the National Vision 2030. The question is, uh, where do you see yourself in the next few years now that there's reshuffle going on in government? Uh, do you do you 
expect to get a phone call to find yourself somewhere in the government soon. And then, and then, we'll, we'll just we'll just read all these last questions, okay. and then so you can just insert them along, so we can get you out of here. You've been great. And then somebody asks whether uh, you are a possible uh, Nobel Peace Prize recipient, uh, following the role of Madame uh, Salif and the uh, Alima boy. Uh, those are the two folks. Those are the two questions, some comments or questions I'm taking from the text messages, and then I will take our very last caller for the night, and that happens to be uh, Mr. D. Flomo. Um, Mr. Flomo, uh, welcome to the Liberian Diaspora Forum. Please keep it brief. Your question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Koma, for taking my call, and thank you for your guest tonight. Uh, the the uh, Reverend the uh, co-chair of the Vision 2030. It's nice to have you on with the Diaspora Forum. Uh, my name is Steve Flo Flomo. I live in the Tony City. And uh, I was just concerned about something that has to do with the era of uh, development, of course, since, of course, we are just coming from 14 years of self-destruction. And many of us have been to Liberia, have been there twice, within the last two years. But yet instead, we realize that there's no kind of a good role system, especially the from a fair role. So what is your take on that subject of development when it comes to role construction? Thank you, Mr. Flomo. So, uh, Ronald Fofana, you can do your closing remarks, uh, including those uh, comments and our questions that were asked uh, the very last ones. All right. Um, thank you so much, and thanks to the caller. Um, in terms of the text messages, specifically the one you asked about um, where do I see myself since I received the call, or, um, I don't know. This is more of a personal development question, I think. Um, but I think basically I'm, I'm, well, I'm more concerned about my education and see um, how I can do some um, education, especially getting a master's degree and then seeing how I can contribute to Liberia. So in whatever ways I can contribute to Liberia, I've been doing that since I was seven, like I mentioned. I've been advocating. Um, I've been involved, whether it's on a low scale or on a community level. I'm just been doing what I, I think I can do. So in whatever capacity I will be needed um, at whatever level, whether it's in the private sector whether it's uh, the advocacy, the civil society, or wherever I can, I can, whether it's in public sector, whatever I can lend my support, that would be better for our country. I'm waiting to, to do that. Um, on the other question of um, possible Nobel Peace Prize, I think that's a funny one. Um, well, I don't know how the, the people who are the lawyer today, um, how what is the process, whether um, how people are, uh, get selected, how, what is the criteria, I don't know. But, you know, the thing about life, you do not know what's going to happen the next day. So no, nobody knew, some of some of us didn't know that we were going to be where we are today. So, I mean, nothing is impossible, especially if you're a strong believer. So we look forward to whatever happens. But, again, if it's a power lawyers, I have received several different awards in different capacities. Um, okay, on the issue of road, what do I think? It's my brother. For me, the issue of development, I want Liberia to be developed for more in time. Well, because I've gone to all these places, all these other meetings, all these countries, and you see countries, you see roles, you see development, and you're like, wow, when will my country be like this or even more than this, you know? So, I mean, what my take is I want Liberia to be developed. I want all of the roles to be constructed. But to be clear on the point on the Gardensville role, um, I live in Gardensville before, though I don't live there now, but I still have family members living um, that side. I think it's a huge challenge because the issue of traffic is not one thing. Um, starting, I think, some time ago, the government went in and broke some structures along the way, along the road, and saying they're going to construct. So I'm sure with the with the plan, I don't know a lot about um, the plan of the of the use of public work in terms of what plan they have. Because what I've heard is they're going to, I mean, open the road up to a four lane road, but I don't have like specific facts on when is that going to be happening, what is the budget, and where, you know, you know, when do we expect to see the, the open road coming in. So 
if you could also find a means to get in touch with the people from the Ministry of Public Works or Honorable Kofi Woods, he will be able to tell you more on the plans they have for road reconstruction because road has been one of the key things in everywhere. But roads that I know that have been constructed of recent time, I mean, the road from 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 uh, from Monrovia to Bikiana is a, is one of the best roads in recent time that have been constructed. It's a really beautiful road, and the Cower Road is also one of the good roads that have been constructed. So there are a few roads that you can see, even uh, the Rabot Hill Road, because sometimes Rabot Hill was a very bad road to, to car on. So the Chinese and all those people involved in that process are really trying to do some, some things in building the road. So everything is not bad. Things are doing good. So again, on those, I hope I'm not leaving any of the points out on things that happen, people, the question they ask. Um, yeah, I think so far those are what I have on my notepad here in terms of materials. But to conclude, let me just first of all start by extending my thanks and appreciation to all of you who stayed up along with me. Um, I think it's two hours, right? Yeah. Yeah, yep, a little more than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, probably more than that, listening to... Uh, me talking about what's happening back home and some of the challenges. Though you may not agree with all of what I've said, though I may not agree with, I may not necessarily agree with all of the things you said or you're thinking, but I think it's hard time that though we we, we have diverse political, uh, what are political, social, educational backgrounds, religious backgrounds, but it is hard time that we be optimistic about Liberia. I know a lot of Liberians who've been in America and in other places for quite a long time, and they haven't like thought to go back home, but they haven't like getting engaged and knowing what's happening on the ground. But it's hard time that we all think on how do we want to develop our country. Though there are people who come to America, they want to be Americans and all that, but it's also important to. To, to have our own, because, we, I mean, people normally say, where well, a neighbor stream is, the neighbor stream will always be there. How do we work collectively to make sure we develop our country? We reconcile our people, we develop our country. The development of, of Liberia depends on all of us. It's not one person. Even with all of the millions and billions that will come to Liberia, it's not going to develop the country if we as Liberians are not prepared to get involved and make sure we all contribute to the southern country. Again, thank you so much for the invitation, and thanks to those who helped to make this a success, and thanks for, thanks for you again for keeping me up to talk for more than <laughs> two hours. I guess you didn't, didn't expect it to be this. Well, uh, folks, uh, I want to uh, start by uh, apologizing to our guests for keeping you up uh, uh, upright. No, it's okay. I don't have time. a problem. Once it's, once it's uh, about. And I want to okay. I want to thank the guests. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming on the show. As far as our next show, I'm happy to report that I've made I have made slight progress uh, in getting through to Minister Brennan Samuka, so we can have a call from Liberia to discuss about the issue of Liberia peacekeeping mission in Mali. Uh, I think that's a topic he's interested in. He has not confirmed yet, but uh, I'm happy to report that I have made some progress in that direction. And if uh, for any reason you didn't get enough of tonight's show, as always, uh, uh, you can dial 559-726-1299 with a SIM access code to listen to the repeat broadcast of tonight's show, uh, at least up until I have the time to upload it on YouTube, just like I've done with uh, many of our previous shows. Uh, with that said, uh, once again, I want to thank Honorable Kula V. Fufana uh, for staying up this late with us. She's uh, indeed a true public servant. Uh, I find it difficult to imagine that, even though she's not in government, but she was treated as a government official today. Uh, she did remarkably well, and uh, we at the Liberian Diaspora Forum are uh, eagerly praying for the speedy recovery of the finance minister so we can see how to bring him on so he can answer many of the questions that were given to the wrong people earlier. With that said, we want to end tonight's show here uh, with our thanks to you, our guests, the listeners. Uh, you have a wonderful night. Thank you. <laughs>
ਜੀ